were sort of talking to our students about suicide prevention was that several young people came to staff and faculty to address issues that were really challenging in their lives. So just being present, being here, talking about these issues, and being aware of the opportunities where we can come together as community to help young people is so critical. So today, I, I, I applaud all of you for the efforts, for the work that you're doing in your own, your own departments, your own organizations, schools, community groups. I applaud you for the work that you do each day. And then also applaud you for this effort, because again, to, I think, impact the challenges that are faced in our community that young people are saying they're dealing with, it's so important that this opportunity of real awareness and real community building is critical. So thank you for doing this today. And it's our pleasure here at Newman to host all of you. And hopefully, uh, we, have some, we have some young people here as well. I want to welcome them from Garnet Valley. It's great that you have students here and the student voice so important in this conversation. So welcome all of you today. So many people helped put this, organ, put this together today, and it is my pleasure now to turn the microphone over, program over to Ann Jennings, who is the administrator uh, here in Delaware County for the drug and alcohol programs here in Delaware County. So it's my great opportunity to introduce Ann Jennings and welcome her to the podium. Congratulations, have a wonderful, uh, wonderful program today. Thank you. Good morning, and welcome to the 2018 Hayes Summit. I have the pleasure of introducing Delaware County's District Attorney, Kadiun M. Copeland, AKA Cat. <laughs> District Attorney Copeland has a distinguished 26 year prosecutorial career in addition to a background of academic excellence as a graduate of the Baldwin School, Bryn Mawr College, Temple's University Beasley School of Law. Prior to being appointed Delaware County's District Attorney in January 2018, she was a member of the United States Attorney's Office I'm sorry, the United States Attorney's Office in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania for six years. She was assigned to the Narcotics and Organized Crime Section. District Attorney Copeland has served for 19 years in the Delaware County's District Attorney Office as Chief of Narcotics Division and was instrumental in establishing Delaware County's first drug treatment court as well as our first veterans court. In addition to her well-honed prosecutorial skills, District Attorney Copeland is an individual with a strong track record of seeking justice and enhancing public safety for residents by fairly, ethically, and aggressively prosecuting those who violate the law. As chair of the Delaware County Heroin Task Force, she has also focused on restorative issues and the opioid epidemic through a countywide collaborative effort centered on prevention, treatment, education, and recovery. Ultimately, her goal and the goal of the Heroin Task Force is to improve the lives of all Delaware County residents. Please welcome District Attorney Kat Copeland. Good morning. 
nice to see so many familiar, wonderful faces here bright and early on a Friday morning. First, I'd like to thank the Delaware County Office of Behavioral Health, Division of Drug and Alcohol, and Holcomb Behavioral Health for coordinating the summit. And as always, thanks to our accommodating and hospitable host, Newman University. Our youth are the individuals who represent the next generation. They are literally our future, which is why it's so incredibly important to understand and recognize the impacts of drug and alcohol use amongst them. And frankly, as you all know, while we're, why we are here today. One tool that has been especially helpful in understanding the knowledge and behaviors related to drug and alcohol use in our youth is the Pennsylvania Youth Survey, PAYS. As many of you know, PAYS is conducted every other year, and it's distributed to students in the 6th, 8th, 10th, and 12th grades to assess knowledge and attitudes and behaviors towards alcohol, tobacco, as well as other drugs. Not only does PAYS gather data on the prevalence of certain behaviors, it asks questions that help provide us with a roadmap as we plan and move forward in the future. A little bit about the survey for you. It's anonymous, it's voluntary, and it's confidential. In Delaware County, 14,213 valid surveys were submitted, which is 73% participation by our students. We're incredibly proud of that fact that all school districts in Delaware County participated in this survey this year. As a result of the data, we've learned some important key facts that will help us guide us forward in events, in prevention efforts, and towards our ultimate goal to save lives. As in previous years, alcohol and marijuana are still the two most commonly used substances amongst our youth. The most common was alcohol, and the second most frequently used substance was marijuana. Although tobacco use, specifically cigarette smoking that is, has substantially decreased, the use of electronic cigarettes and vaping has been on the rise. The CDC found that discreteness, a perceived lack of harm, and flavors are a big part of the reason teens are latching onto these products. I'm talking about flavors like cotton candy, sour apple, fruit punch, those things that are aimed at our youth. A study also showed that 50% of youth believe that Juul's, which is a specific brand of e-cigarettes, were nicotine-free, which, which the reality is that 99% of these products actually do contain nicotine. In 2018, Juul's accounted for about 40% of the e-cigarette market, grossing $150 million in retail sales the last quarter alone. In addition to being smoke-free, and flavorful, the appeal of the product specifically is that they don't look like e-cigarettes, right? They're small, they can be mistaken for a USB drive, and they're easily concealed. In other words, this product is a product that teens are able to use inconspicuously without drawing as much attention from their parents or from their teachers. Although vaping is often viewed as a safer alternative to cigarette smoking, the risks aren't fully known at this point in time, as vaping products are unregulated by the FDA and health studies are still in progress. You'll hear a lot about vaping today, but needless to say, these products leave a lot of questions and frankly, much room for concern. The most commonly early initiated and prevalent substance use was alcohol, with nearly 40% reporting use in our county. The most next frequently used drug was marijuana, indicating a 19% indicating a lifetime usage. As a former chief of the Delaware County District Attorney's Narcotics Unit and a former assistant United States Attorney, I know firsthand, without question, that drugs, including marijuana and crime, go hand in hand. Setting aside the issue of whether or not it's considered a quote-unquote gateway drug, this purportedly harmless drug is inextricably linked to crime. Most of our 10,000 criminal cases that come through our courtrooms every year involve drugs, including marijuana. And those crimes that include marijuana and drugs partner hand in hand with domestic violence cases, robberies, DUIs, and homicides. 
Well, the good news is that opioid and prescription use, specifically prescription drug use, is low amongst our youth in Delaware County at 3.9% according to the 2017 data. And our overall opioid-related deaths are down countywide amongst all our residents compared to last year. We still must recognize the fact that these deadly drugs are killing Delaware County residents and remain both a local and national epidemic. Opioids are a real and current threat to our youth, who at some point are being exposed to it in pill form in all likelihood, sometimes through a seemingly harmless prescription for a sports injury. So far this year in Delaware County, we've seen 166 related drug deaths compared to 185 at this time last year. While our numbers of drug-related deaths is lower, and more and more over deaths unfortunately, are the direct result of fentanyl. According to our medical examiner, the majority of drug-related deaths here in Delaware County specifically are opioid-related. Over 50% of those decedents have fentanyl in their system. Even more disconcerting is that we have seen three confirmed cases of three methyl fentanyl, an even deadlier form of that drug. What's con what is concerning is that young people often believe that these substances are safer than illicit drugs because they are considered prescription medications. However, everyone in this room knows that's far from the case. According to 2017 data, 40% of students, quote unquote, took them from a family member living in my home. And they indicated as that is their most frequently source and method of obtaining prescription drugs that they used without a doctor's prescription. The next most frequently reported source of prescription drugs was a friend or family member who gave them to them, with 35.4% of students indicating that method of obtaining prescription medication. For years, one of our top priorities has been to find ways to remove opioids from homes, or to ensure residents secure them in the alternative by raising awareness through campaigns such as Lock Up Your Meds, in order to ensure prescription drugs don't get into the wrong hands or aren't disposed of improperly. Part of these efforts have been providing pill pods to residents through Holcomb and the Office of Behavioral Health to provide a way to secure drugs for residents within their own home. Since 2013, the Heroin Task Force has installed more than 40 permanent medicine drop boxes at all our local police departments and at our hospitals. We now also have a mobile drug collection van, which we've brought into the, into the part of our initiative, and even a collection van that goes out to a community to pick up and to destroy any drugs. Through these initiatives, we're proud to say we've collected and safely destroyed over 14 tons of drugs. We must continue, however, our efforts to remove these drugs from homes so they don't get into the hands of our youth. While also, we must continue to raise awareness amongst our adults, including prescribers, about the dangers that they pose to our youth and our county residents. For too long, we've looked at drug addiction through the lens of criminal justice. And as a former narcotics officer, I still believe that one of the most important things we can do is to reduce the demand for drugs. But most importantly, I know that substance use disorder is a disease and a public health problem and not solely one that impacts our criminal justice system, but impacts lives every single day in Delaware County. Ahead of the curve, after seeing overdose deaths triple in five years, we formed the Delaware County Heroin Task Force in September of 2012. We're proud to say that in partnership with all of you in this room, Delaware County has been a leader across the state and in much of the country in combating the opioid epidemic. But we've learned that there's still a great need of work deal of work, rather, that needs to be done. We're constantly in the process of reevaluating the needs of our residents, coupled with focusing our efforts on prevention, education, and recovery. We try to be proactive and forward-thinking, and as we face each hurdle, we work with our partners, including our partner county agencies, our schools, community leaders, NOPE, and our local law enforcement partners and endeavor to create new partnerships every single day to address emerging issues. As the first county in Pennsylvania to equip police officers with a life-saving drug Narcan, 
More than 1,300 lives have been saved since the program launched in November of 2014. Indeed. We have certified recovery specialists who specialize in connecting overdose survivors with recovery and treatment resources. We work with emergency rooms, police, crisis centers, physicians, and families to reach people who recently survived an overdose. That is what our certified recovery specialists do every single day. They offer treatment referrals, support services, and information on insurance and treatment options at no cost to our residents. For those whose crimes are rooted in drug addiction, our drug treatment court offers an intensive program that allows offenders to address substance addiction. Since we launched this court in 2008, 10 years ago, 217 individuals have graduated over the course of 21 graduation ceremonies. And, thank you. and an even more astounding and proud statistic is 86% of those have remained crime free, and 26, excuse me, 24 babies have been born drug free as a result. Through all these efforts, it has become clear that opioid addiction is no longer an isolated program, excuse me, an isolated problem for a select few. It is an epidemic that is affecting all aspects of our society. As your district attorney, another concern in addition to drug and alcohol use is violence in our, in our schools. In the past 12 months, 20% of students in this county reported being threatened with violent behavior on school property, with nearly 9% of students reporting having actually been attacked on school property. This essentially means that 3,000 of our students experience violence in their school in some shape or form. While this is extremely disheartening and completely unacceptable, the data is what we call an indicator. It gives us a roadmap moving forward to address and stop the violence. Just last week, we held our Safe School Summit to pro proactively address school safety. Here in Delaware County, we're proud of the fact that for 19 years since the devastating Columbine shooting, the District Attorney's Office has been proactive by holding these Safe School Summits. Starting these summits two decades ago about, we were at the forefront taking steps to protect our schools. We do it hand in hand with partners in our community and our law enforcement. Sadly, we're in an era where we don't have the luxury of living in an ivory tower, burying our head in the sand when it comes to the risk our nation faces with respect to school safety. When children have to worry about guns and drugs more than math or science, then we know we must do more. Even if there is one school, one school in our community where that is the case, then we as a community must work together to change that. Comprised of more than 200 attendees, many of you in this room attended the summit, which we're extremely grateful for and value. We meet again today to continue the discussion of ensuring the well-being of students and in turn, the better the generation of lives ahead, improving their lives on a day-to-day -day basis. In Delaware County, while we certainly have more to do in this regard, we also have a lot to be proud of, including our outstanding network of behavioral health professionals such as yourselves here in this room, mental health experts, healthcare professionals, psychologists, educators, nurses. You have chosen a career rooted in service volunteers specifically to help the vulnerable and ensure the well-being of our most precious resource, our children. This is truly a valiant undertaking. As your district attorney, I'm proud to be here with you today and for us to learn from each other and to be part of the continued discussion as we go forward. I hope you enjoyed today's pay summit.
I'm Laura Fedorowitz. I am the Drug and Alcohol Assistant Administrator for the Delaware County Office of Behavioral Health. And I have the privilege of introducing our keynote speaker today, um, who doesn't want me to actually say anything about her. She wants to tell you her accomplishments herself. So if you can put your hands together for Trish Caldwell, the Corporate Director for Family Services at the Recovery Centers of America. So, my name is Trish Caldwell. What I won't be doing is giving you all of my accomplishments. <laughs> what I will do is give you a little bit of understanding as to why would I be up here speaking today. Um, and so some of you may know me, um, some of you may have been trained by me. And so what today means for me is we have all of that information now of what we understand is impacting our youth. So what do we do about it? I have been working in this field for over 25 years. I have the honor of being able to work in direct care with adolescents and young adults. I have had the privilege to work with their families in an attempt to make some long-term changes in the lives that they are currently living. And so honestly, that's kind of what puts me here. So not the accomplishments, not what I've done, not where I go, um, but I care. And so that's kind of where I'm going to be starting. So I do want to thank Newman University. I feel like I'm a part of Newman's family. I used to teach here for eight years. So it was fantastic. I love being back here. It kind of brought up some nice, wonderful feelings. And I want to thank all of you for being here. This is important. So I am the Director of Family Services at Recovery Centers of America, but I am always a part of the community in trying to figure out what do we need to do? How do we keep kids from getting into trouble? What do we need to do to give them the skills and the tools to be able to effectively change their lives? And what do each of us, I always say, each one of us is the captain of the ship and the children are the passengers. They're watching us. If we let them know that this ship is sturdy and that we are leading them in the right direction, the reality is that kids will trust us. But there's a lot going on for our youth today. When we're reading through the PAYS data, we are seeing that there's more kids that may be experimenting with alcohol and marijuana. There's a lot of confusing messages around that and what is developmentally appropriate and how do they understand what's supposed to happen and what isn't supposed to happen, what are my risks. And so for every teenager and every family I've ever worked with, I've always said this, when you understand things better, you do them better. And our kids aren't doing things because they want to be bad or because they don't care. Fundamentally, our kids are doing what they think they need to do to get through the day. And our job is to help them recognize what they could do to make a profound change in their lives. So that's a little bit more about what we're gonna talk about. So again, I won't give you anything else that I've done. I don't know if this works. <laughs> If not, then I'm going to be winging it, which wouldn't be the first time. There we go. So I will say, so for those of you, again, that know who I am, I do a lot of different trainings. I am out in the community a lot. And so when I said I'm going to be doing this keynote speech and I was nervous, one of my good friends was like, what are you possibly nervous about? Like, why would you be nervous doing this? And I'm like, because this one, the trainings are trainings. This one matters. This one's about kids. And so how are we going to be able to get everybody to hear the language in a way that they know that each one of us is equally as capable of making the difference in a child's life? That we're gonna look at the risks, we're gonna look at the resilience, but I'm like, how do I start that? I don't want this to be a training. I don't want this to be where I'm telling you about what the developmental needs of an adolescent is, how to understand their brain. I want this to be something that when you leave here, you feel like, I can do this. I can make a difference in not just the child that I know, but equally as important to the child we think doesn't deserve it. And so what stuck struck me was that at the same time that I was struggling with like, how am I gonna start this? Because I'm not gonna just give them a whole bunch of data. I watched a story on Good Morning America. And the story was a dad that confronts his son's bully. 
Now, when you normally hear that, you're assuming because what we see in the media is that there's always something that happens, that there is some kind of interaction that might have occurred, and so they kind of are trying to get this tagline. But when you watch the story, what occurred is that an eight-year-old little boy was being bullied by an 11-year-old little boy. That the father did what he thought was in the best interest of his son, and he called the school. He attempted to be able to resolve this in a way that he felt would be effective for his child, that he wanted to protect his child. But mind you, every ounce of him wanted to do something to that child that was bullying. We all have that instinct, right? There's nobody that can mess with our child without us wanting to do something in retaliation. This father was no different. And so the school said that they were looking to address it, but it continued to happen. And so what the father did, which was different than what most people do, and this is where we step in, is the father reached out to the bully himself. And what he heard was that this 11-year-old boy was also being bullied. That this 11-year-old little boy was being bullied because his clothes were dirty, because he wasn't able to take a shower, and that this was his projection, and that why he got involved is because he had stolen his son's phone. And that when that child, the 11-year-old little boy, again, I'm gonna keep saying that, an 11-year-old little boy, when he got suspended because he had stolen the phone, this father leaned in. And this father went and on the day of the suspension, picked up that little boy and took him to the store and bought him clothes. Bought him new clothes, was able to help talk to him, discussed with him what was going on in his life. And not only did this little boy not have clothes and wasn't able to shower, that he found out that he was homeless. And as a result of that father leaning into him as opposed to sitting in the rage that he felt in regards to his son being bullied, he not only made the difference in his own child's life because he was demonstrating the behaviors that we all want from ourselves, but he changed the life of that little boy who at 11 years old, and we all know this to be true, at 11 years old could have already been labeled a bully. Would have already been starting the diagnoses of oppositional defiant, right, working him towards a life of criminality. And as a result of a father leaning in, he profoundly impacted the child's life and had his son and that little 11-year-old boy sitting across from each other and he said, you guys are going to work this out because today you guys are brothers. Because today, for the rest of your lives, you will always have each other's backs. We all have the potential to do that to a child. We are quick to looking at the behaviors of a child and asserting them to be who they are. Rather than stepping back and saying, why are they that? And so when we start talking about the risk and the protective factors, this is what we need to take away from that. This story of somebody that was just willing to care enough about a child who most don't want to care about, who most just wanted to have a suspension, and that's rude, and they are horrible children, and this father cared enough to say, why? Why would a child engage in these behaviors? That's what we can take. And so I'm going to talk about some of the risk factors. I'm going to talk about some of the protective factors. But this is the takeaway. When we lean into a child, we change the course of their life. Not just the course of an action, the course of their life. And that not all children are given the same opportunities. And so that becomes an important piece. I don't know how to this thing. <laughs> the good news is that it isn't me. <laughs> I was not able to figure this out because we can't rule that out ever. Sometimes it is me. <laughs> And so when we're looking at that idea, when we take away from it that bottom line, strong bonds motivate young people to adopt healthy standards for behavior. 
That's it. Strong bonds. And so you're going to hear me using this information continuously. Our ability to connect with one another is going to be one of the ways that we're going to be able to heal. That when we engage in opportunities to look at a young child, no matter what their age is, no matter what they're doing, that we're looking at opportunities to engage them in a way that allows for them to see themselves through the eyes of somebody that thinks they are worthy, that they are capable, and that they have a possibility out. And so as we start kind of getting through some of the slides, I'll be able to highlight again some of the information that when we're looking, interestingly, at some of the risk factors, some of the highest risk factors that we're seeing within the youth today is low commitment to their neighborhoods, family chaos, and poor school performance. And so some of our highest risk factors, and so the data that I take from that is not like, so how do we, you know, because we just heard that while there's 20% of kids that are feeling that, that they didn't feel safe in school, that suggests 80% did. 80% of our children feel safe in school. They feel heard by their teachers, that it was close to 80% where students felt that they had the ability to go to a teacher and talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. That they felt that their teachers or their staff in their school cared about them. And so the idea of kind of the principle of like positive psychology, which is one of the classes that I taught here, right? The principle behind that is that sometimes the best way to make a movement isn't to focus in on what we're doing wrong, but to focus in on what are we doing right. And 80% is suggesting we're actually doing a whole lot of things right. That when we look at kind of throughout the years, when we see these high-risk behaviors of the adolescents when they're engaging in drinking or when they're smoking weed, and we're seeing weed being a little bit higher today because we are kind of catching up. But historically, what we understand is that the more we educate them, the better decisions they make. That when we empower them with information and help tie them into their future goals, kids tend to make better choices. But if we're not having those conversations in a way that allows space to be able to have an honest dialogue, then they're having it with their peers. And so every time I sit down with a teenager who tells me all the reasons he should be allowed to smoke weed, right, that it's legal and I should be able to do this and all these other things, and I separate the idea of criminalization, which we're not going to get into here, versus what it does to your brain and how it's going to motivate your behaviors and how it might impact your long-term goals, that they pay attention to. That allows them to start making different decisions. That when we're looking at, again, helping to empower our youth to understanding. So again, those are wonderful statistics that you just heard from the DA in regards to them experimenting with pills and navigating themselves through. That when they are educated, they tend to make better decisions, but they are at a young, vulnerable age where peers become almost as important as their families, although I just said almost. And so as I get through this keynote speak, you're going to hear me talk a lot about the families. Because what we have seen is historically, they're the ones left out. And that most change that occurs within a child is going to change at the root of their family. That no matter what the risk factors are, a family has the ability to either help move them in the direction that that child is wanting to go, or to hold them back. And the thing about a family is that they're never driven towards that. That sometimes, again, families are doing what they know. Families are doing what they have had done to them. And that if we don't give them the same affordability, and so again, if we go back to that father that decided that he was going to reach out to that young man, had he done it in a different way and judged the mom who was doing the best that she could, raising her son in a homeless shelter, she'd have gotten defensive. We all would. If somebody judges our parenting, if somebody judges the way that we're treating our child or raising our child. But what he did is created space where there was no judgment of what she was doing and a way that she was going to be able to, he could support her in addition to supporting him. That's, again, the collective kind of how do we pull this together? Communities, families. And so again, I can't say, you know, I always feel like I have to kind of do the whole disclaimer. I'm a family therapist, so I fundamentally believe in the importance of the family. 
I'm also somebody that has worked in this field for over 25 years. And I realize with every part of my being, I'm not going to be able to change this child without the help of their family. That the system is always going to be stronger than me. And a child is never going to pick me over their family. Even if that child genuinely enjoys coming to see me and likes having the work that we're doing and has been with me for a long time, the reality is that they're always going to side with their family over me. And so the question becomes, how do we do that? Here's the thing about families. Most people don't want to work with them. Most family, most people find them complicated. Most are upset at them, most are angry at them. And again, in one of the last trainings that I engaged in, we talked a lot about the idea of the bill collector. That if we think about how we engage families, typically we are reaching out to them in a way that says, your child just did something horrible. That's when we give them the phone calls. So your and I was overdue on most of my bills. As soon as I see that, I'm going to decline it. The second I see that phone ringing and I see a bill collector, I'm like, decline. No, thank you. Because I already know that what's on the other end of that phone call is bad news. Why would I answer that? That's not a parent being resistant, right? Which is what we kind of create. And again, this is the shift in the way that we're looking at how we're going to treat not just the problematic behaviors and the risks, but what are we going to do to build resilience? The same respect that I'm saying we need to give to the children, we need to give to those families, because if we are calling them with only bad news, we are the bill collectors. That's not resistance, we all do that. Whoever you don't want to speak to, you decline. You answer the phone calls that you want to hear from. So if it's somebody that I genuinely enjoy hearing from, that's the phone call I answer. And so shifting our way to empower these families is that sometimes it requires us leaning into them a little bit more frequently, calling them to tell you that I genuinely love your child, that I think that this child is worth so much and has a great sense of humor and is so kind and considerate. For a lot of families, that's the first time that they have gotten that phone call. And so when we look at this through that lens, families aren't being resistant. Families are doing the best that they can and chronically feeling overwhelmed. And so if I am declining the bill collector, I'm not resisting it. It's that in that moment, I'm appreciative that what else do you want me to do? I know I owe you money, but I don't have it. That's your family's. I know you want me to do something about my child but I don't know what else to do. And so when you continue to come at me, telling me another thing that they've done, I'm doing the best that I can. What do you want me to do? And so changing the story becomes part of the healing process. And again, you're gonna hear me saying this. I'm gonna highlight, at some point, highlight the risk and the protective factors. <laughs> Right now, I'm just stonewalling, right? I'm doing what I gotta do to make sure I can get through this. But the reality is that that is what the important piece is. That I'm gonna be saying that we need to pay attention. That we need to be paying attention to not just what the risk factors are, but again, when we get there, interestingly enough, what we're going to find is that the human connection is one of your greatest protective factors. So the pays data, I'm not gonna go over because DA Copeland already went over that. But when we're looking at Delaware County risk factors, and so this is directly from your PAYS data, we're highlighting what some of the key risk factors are for our families, for our youth today. So what are they? Low neighborhood attachment, perceived risk of drug use, parental attitudes favorable towards antisocial behavior, and low commitment towards school. So when we look at that, This is that moment that we go, so what do we do with that? But every thread of that is demonstrating connection. Low neighborhood attachment. When you don't feel that you are connected to something, and so I see a couple of police officers in here, there's no greater person that can connect to a child or a family. But if they're the bill collectors, it's hard to connect to. <laughs> so if we're the school, 
and we're always the bill collectors. Nobody in this room is connecting to a bill collector. So you gotta make sure that you are engaging in just as many pro-social behaviors as you are holding them accountable to the ones that you expect more from because what you will never hear is me saying, I condone any behaviors because I set higher expectations for them because I believe that they have the ability to do more in their lives. But I understand that in that moment they might have been doing what they thought was the only option they had. And so I'm not angry at it and I'm not shaming it I'm saying, we need to get you more connected. Because if we keep going back to that same child, that 11-year-old little boy, it is very easy for him to go on down this path. That the perceived risk of drug use, I can't emphasize this enough, when kids understand the risks, they make better choices. Kids are smart, but they make emotionally decision, emotional decisions. They are sitting in the wrong system, so they are chronically making decisions in an emotional state. But when they understand their risks, they tend to make better choices. And so that's all of us. If we condone it, and there's a lot of people that will say, I actually don't think that smoking weed is that big of a deal. If we condone it, they will do it, period. If we condone it, they will do it. And so we have to set an example of not being angry at it, but understanding it. Because what the majority of our youth today, when they are using weed, they're saying that this is recreational. But the second they use alone, that's a coping skill. Recreational suggests that you're doing this with your friends. And what kids are doing today with marijuana is smoking it alone. Smoking it before they go to school because it reduces their anxiety. Smoking it before they go to bed because they can't sleep through the night. That's a coping skill. That has profound long-term impacts on the development of their brain because their brain's not done developing. And if that's the coping skill, that's the one that starts to get seared into their brain is that's what you're supposed to do when you get stressed, when you can't sleep. And so understanding this isn't a judgment of what should or shouldn't be in regards to marijuana use. All the research, and again, I've worked with plenty of adolescents that give me all of the research that they've read. And what I will always say to them is, what's the age of the participants in your research? I don't know. And I'm like, well, I do, because it's my job. It's adults. The impact of marijuana on an adult brain is not the same as the impact on an adolescent. And so that's an important distinguish, distinction. So having that conversation and low commitment to school. We have a lot of wonderful people here from the school systems. Kids would rather be bad than stupid, period. If a kid thinks that he can't do well in school, he would rather act up than be, stuck, be dumb. Because when you're dumb, that impacts your confidence. That impacts who you think you are. And so if I'm bad, I have options, I have choice, and I have control. And so every child wants to do well in school. Every child wants to do well in school. When we see a child that doesn't, it's because there's obstacles. And that I will always say. Every child that comes in and says, I don't care about school, church, it's stupid. That's what I remind myself. He would rather be bad than stupid. And so how do I help him to feel competent? How do I build that peace? Because everybody wants to work on self-esteem. Everybody wants to work on confidence. And I have it somewhere in the slide. I don't know where. Competence builds confidence. Therapists don't. Parents don't. Teachers don't. Competence does. So then what can we do? Find places for them to build their competence. Find places that they can do well and show them. Because nobody can tell somebody to be confident. No one person can raise somebody else's self-esteem. Competence does that. So who are the kids that have great self-esteem? Kids that are doing well at something and see it and are told, I see you doing well in that. And part of our jobs, again, if we collectively recognize that our job is to really help empower these youth because they are our future, 
is figuring out for that child that's struggling the most, how do you see them for who they are and find their competence? Find what they're really good at and allow them to know that they are good at something. Because this world might be telling them they're not. Because their circumstances and their behaviors are reinforcing that they're not. So how do we show them that they are? And so when we're looking at this, kids are experimenting with alcohol and marijuana. This slide I'm going to go over a little bit less again because it's just the DA covered a lot of this information. But we know what the kids are doing. We know that there's an increase. And again, the difference that I'm going to say is that no behaviors are being condoned. They're being explored. There's consequences to our actions. Consequences work. And so they need to have consequences, but they don't need to have judgment. They don't need to have shame. They need to have an understanding of, like, these are the consequences to your actions, but what's going on that's continuing to get you there? Because that's the work that we can do. We need to find where they need to have that competence. And that's just taking those extra couple of minutes for that father taking those extra few minutes to say to that child, why are you bullying? That opens up the doors for this father to find competence in this young man that will change the course of his life. That's what we all can do. And so again, for those of you that know me, and I've been working in this field for a very long time, I have worked with all of those high-risk kids. I have worked with kids that have had depression and self-harm, who have been in and out of detention. And when I genuinely say, man, you're a good kid, I mean it. And then I tell them what it is about them that I genuinely like. Because that's the only way you're going to build confidence. And so here's the quote. Every child deserves a champion. Every child deserves a champion. I could get on my soapbox, which I won't, of the idea of how many children are getting diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder or how we're going to be diagnosing these kids. And so that puts them into a box where we say that these are kids that are going to be a precursor to the, you know, the world of criminality and incarceration. Or you could say this is a child that just needs love. This is a child that just needs connection. And take it a step further and say, this is a family that needs the same thing. Because for every one of those child, children that I just mentioned, I haven't yet met a family that didn't care. I haven't yet met a family that was like, I don't care what happens to them. But I've met plenty that said, I don't know what else to do, I'm overwhelmed. I've met so many families that have said, I'm actually a better parent than what I had been given. I've met a lot of parents that say, when she says she's going to kill herself, I'm so overwhelmed and terrified that I just get angry and shut down. I've never heard the parent that says, I just don't care. Have I heard those actual words? Yes. Because when you get overwhelmed, you shut down. But when that parent keeps showing up, when I continue, after putting in some legwork so that I'm not the bill collector, they always want what's best for their child. But inadvertently might be perpetuating a behavior. And so every child deserves a champion. Period. So when we start to look for the risk factor, or the protective factors, here's the thing about protective factors. Every child wants to do well, period. Every child wants to do well. When you see little guys in elementary school that are struggling, struggling behaviorally and academically, know that they're your highest risk. Because that's a fundamental developmental age where those kids are desiring to do well, that they are using every ounce of their energy to do well, to get praise, to be good, to do what you say that they need to do. And when they fundamentally can't, that's a high risk. Because we just saw that the higher risk behaviors lead them closer to using drugs, increase the likelihood of them getting into criminal behavior, 
increase the likelihood of them not completing school. By the age of eight, we know who the high risks are. You see them. Those are the ones that we lean into. That 11-year-old little boy would have been high risk for a drop out of high school, to increase the likelihood of substance use, and to engage in criminal behavior. And by a simple action, that father might have changed the entire trajectory of that little boy's life. Because as opposed to starting to see him through the lens of somebody that doesn't care, he saw them through a different lens, through pain of this 11-year-old little boy, through fear of being teased himself, and through the trauma of being homeless and not knowing what was going to happen next for him. So changing that lens. So here is the important piece that I keep kind of circling around when it comes to families. The top three protective factors for youth all start all three. So while we can increase all of these wonderful programs, while we can increase all of these opportunities for kids to do well and be well and engage in all of our community events and school events, the top three protective factors for our youth are their families. And so when we keep the family at arm's length, we are robbing them of those strongest protective factors these kids have. Because connection to your family is one of the best predictors of long-term success. And success can be measured as happiness, career, college, whatever you want to measure happy or success as. Families. So the common denominator, again, when we engage the families, we have a better rate at impacting that child's life. We are better equipped at empowering that family. And without empowering that family, it makes it harder to empower that child. And so in one of the trainings that I did with trauma, right? So again, I'm a family therapist. There's no such thing as a family that I'm not willing to bring in. I've had family members that were selling drugs. I've had family members that have severe mental illness themselves. I have had family members that have attempted suicide. I have had family members that want their kids to sell drugs because it helps to pay for their bills. I have had family members that have used abuse within their household that are involved in DHS or CYS or whichever the organization is where you live. And every one of those family members was equally as important to me in the work that I was doing with their child. There is no family that I don't think is important enough. Because I still believe under the pretense that every family is doing the best that they can. And that as I say about the child, I say it about the family. If the family feels that they know something different, that they can help their child, they will. But for a lot of families that are caught in their own lives, that are overwhelmed with the circumstances of their situation, that might be overwhelming with their bills, that might be overwhelming with, you know, overwhelmed with their own mental illness, these are families that just don't know what else to do. These are not families that aren't trying. These are not families that don't care. And the greatest change I've ever seen is when I've gotten the family on board. And so at one of those trainings, somebody said, I don't know if I agree with you. And I said, bring it. Who do you think I shouldn't have in? And he said, I had a young man whose mom was selling drugs and who he had to sell drugs because mom wanted him to, because he was a part of paying the bills. And I go, okay, what happened? He said, I told him that I didn't want mom involved and that I was going to say, I don't think that you should be living there. This was somebody 18, so we're certainly not looking at a youth that's being potentially put in harm's way. And I said, and what happened when you said that? Never saw the kid again. So then nobody's helping them. So then nobody is having the conversation with them. And when people are left to themselves to have the conversation, they're stuck in the situation that they're stuck in. 
It's like having, you know, it's like me saying to a teenager, you know where you should get your information about marijuana? Another teenager. They're literally going to be talking about the same exact thing. It's all they know. And so for the families, there's a lot of that same dynamic going on. If we're not having that, have I had family members where I've been able to say, listen, I know you want your child to be sober, but some of the behaviors that you're engaging in are putting them at risk, that they've said, yeah. And I go, so what do we do about that? And the family started to problem solve what they should do about that. That despite this parent that might be using or engaging in their own behaviors, if I could just get them to have different expectations of their child, that's what can change the course of their lives. But if I don't get the family to give that permission, the child will be loyal to the family, not me. Even if rationally I make sense, the child will be loyal to the family, and the family will continue to do what they know, because this is what they know. We all do that. And so engaging that family becomes the key piece to strengthening. And again, when I normally go around, because everybody, not everybody loves working with the family, and I say, what's the biggest reason that you're not pulling in that family? They don't call me back, because you're the bill collector. Or they seem aggressive, or they don't seem like they care. And I go, that's on you, because that's your judgment that's kind of prompting your interaction with them. Who are we to say a family doesn't care? Who are we to say that they need to behave in a certain way in order to be able to love and support their child? That's you wanting them to be like your family, and these aren't your families. This is theirs. We're not trying to get them to be like us. We're trying to get them to be where they want to be in the system that they've created, and we fundamentally have a belief that they do want what's best for their family and their loved ones. So changing the expectations and changing the dialogue that changes our youth. And so sometimes any one of us can call a family member and say, you know what, I was just with your child. I genuinely like them, you must be so proud. For a lot of these families, they've never heard that. And imagine that as you, as a parent, if you are struggling doing the best that you can, overcoming adversity after adversity after adversity, and nobody has ever said anything positive to you about you raising your child. When it's easy, it's easy. When it's hard, we're all struggling. And somebody needs to lean in and say, I see you. I see how much you care. And you must be really proud. Those words are profound for some and for some have never heard. We all can be that to somebody. That when it says every child needs a champion, so does every family. And sometimes the family just needs to re be reminded that the champion is actually inside your house. That that parent can still be the champion. And when they're distraught, that it makes sense that it's struggling. That when any of us are under that kind of stress, it's hard for us to be our best selves. So pay close attention to what you want to see and who they really are and highlight it. That's where change occurs. And so when we see the idea of seven things that every child needs to hear, I say everyone because everyone needs to hear this. Everyone needs to hear this every family. So again, I can't overemphasize the three strongest indicators for protective factors of family. When do you think the last time somebody told a family that they're proud of them? Because if you strengthen the family, they will strengthen their child. Families just do what they think is right. So they're bringing their child to me saying, Trish, you fix them. And I'm like, I'm not going to fix them. This is yours. You get to keep them. You can fix this. Because I'm not the expert of your own child. You are. You know what your child needs. There's just barriers that we got to figure out how to release for you. Because you're trying. Here you are still fighting. 
Here's your child that's struggling with all of these things, and yet here you are. When do you think that somebody said that to a family member or a child? And if a family member hears this, they're more inclined to then trickle it down. If somebody tells a mother or a father, I am proud of you, this has to be so hard, and I am so proud that you keep fighting. That person is more inclined to trickle it down. But if those words have never been said to a family, why would we expect that these are in their vocabulary? Why would we expect that they would even know how to say that to a child? You gotta understand the circumstances of somebody's life before you tell them what they're doing is wrong. And then you gotta empower them anyway. Because we all do better when somebody is our cheerleader. We all make better decisions when somebody says, I believe that you have the ability to do it and here's how you do it. But we all can go down that rabbit hole if we get caught in it and nobody's telling us anything and everybody becomes a bill collector. I'm listening. Because again, normally when parents are under distress, which is when we engage them, right, those high risk factors, we're not listening because they're already kind of set off and we're frustrated, we're angry, and so nobody's listening. We're just reacting to one another. That when somebody's like, I don't know how you handle it, when somebody is disrespectful, I'm like, it's not about me. I'm just telling them I'm listening. I get it. People have a lot of things going on in their lives. Some communities are riddled with violence. Who are we to judge how they're supposed to respond in that if we're not in it? I'm listening allows you to understand it. And this is your responsibility. So again, we're not condoning behaviors. There's responsibilities, and the reality is that I expect something different of you, but I'm just gonna work with you to get there. But it is your responsibility. You might not have gotten you where you are, but it is your responsibility to get you out. So I'm not gonna judge it. I'm not gonna you know, judge why you got there, but it is your responsibility to get out. So let's figure this out. There's consequences to your actions. So we wanna make sure that we're empowering you in a way that you're allowing yourselves to figure out how to deal with those consequences. And so as I start to kind of wrap things up, I can see everybody's getting a little restless, right? Everybody's gotta go to the bathroom and get up. Here's the thing about resiliency. Everybody wants to say, some kids are resilient. Nope. Resiliency is built. So resiliency, so when we look at small children and we go, wow, they were so resilient. I always go, so what did you do when you were little? People will start to shout out, my positive psych class that I did here, we had, I made them do it. Right, what did you do when you were little? Played baseball, great. Played Barbies, G.I. Joe, Legos, climbed a tree, rode my bike, Played hide and seek, tag, ghost in the graveyard, all of these wonderful things. And I go, man, that's a lot of fun things. You hear a child giggle, nothing better. And then I go, because now they're using drugs, right? Now they're getting caught in the criminality. But their lives were hard then. But they had all of these things that they put into their bank. And I go, what do you do today? Some of you might need to ask yourselves, because here's the thing, sometimes we get burned out and our own ability to be burned out affects our ability to be able to hear somebody else's experiences. If I'm burned out, I'm not really available for you because now I'm sinking. So I'm doing the best that I can in this moment. And so, you know, where I work, I'm like, listen, that's stuff that you gotta work through. You gotta do that outside of these doors because the second you walk in these doors, you're for them. They're not here for you, They're, we're here for them. And so when I say, what do you do to take care of yourself? It's like crickets. They're like, I don't know. I don't have time. And I go, all right, I, mean, I have issue with that. We're gonna have to talk about that one in a second. Because here's the thing, you don't need to do deposits as in these like big trips. You don't need to do these like big things. Those are wonderful, but if you put a dollar in the bank every day, 
you're still moving in the right direction. You don't have to wait till you have $100 or $200. If you put a little bit in your bank every day, then your bank starts to get full because here's what life is. It's full of withdrawals. We can't help them with that. That is life. But if there are more withdrawals in their lives than deposits, that's not that they're not resilient, it's that they're bankrupt. Resilience is built. It is not something that you either have or you do not have. It is built. And so when I say, what do you do for yourself? And they go, well, I mean, sometimes kids will say, I play sports. And I go, that's terrific. Do you feel pressure with sports today? Yes, and I go, well, then that's both. That's a deposit and a withdrawal. Because when you were little, it was just a straight out deposit. You played football, you were a powder puff, or, you know, little, li whatever, powder puff is the girls, right? Now I don't remember what the little boys is, even though I have four brothers. Those are all deposits. In high school, it's not a deposit, because now it's pressure. You need to do well, you need to be in shape. And so it's both. And so every person that I work with, every family that I treat, I will say, we need to figure this out because the reality is that if you're in bankruptcy, why would I ask you to do anything else? It's like taking, you know, squeezing blood from a stone. Why would I ask you to be able to do all of these extra things that I need you to do for your child if you're in bankruptcy? I'm not asking somebody that's in bankruptcy for $200. I'm going after the person that's not bankrupt. For these families, they just need to understand that because what they'll do is they'll assess it to themselves. I just can't be happy. Our whole lives are hopeless. These things just don't ever change. We're not those people. And I'll go, it just is showing that you're bankrupt. And that those deposits can be small. We can put deposits in their piggy bank. That when we notice something good about them, because here's the beauty, positivity feeds positivity, here's the downside, negativity feeds negativity. And so if we start a cycle of saying, I am proud of you, my gosh, look at all that you are overcoming to get yourself here to fight and advocate for your child. That's impressive, that's a deposit. We all have the ability to be depositing in somebody else's piggy bank. We all have the responsibility to attempt to find out what somebody's doing well and to highlight it. To be able to say to somebody, I see this is working for you. That's what you should keep doing. And again, that fundamental principle behind what is positive psychology, pay attention to what we're doing right. The world is feeding us with everything that we're doing wrong. And so when somebody comes to me and they say, Trish, I relapsed, and they want to sit in the misery of what happened with the relapse, I'm like, the reality is that for the last six days and 13 hours, you were sober. So what did you do those days? Well, I don't know. And I go, well, that's what we're going to figure out. A trigger got you to the relapse. That I know. We'll get to that eventually. But I need you to know that you actually were doing well. That's what we do for our families, that when we look at the risk factors that some of our kids are having to deal with, we can't solve that today. We can't save a child from the environment that they are in. But we can attempt to make these small changes that create a rippling effect to continue to build bigger ones. We can see a child for the potential that they have, we can share our vision of who we think they're going to be and how they're going to get there. We can pull in their family to be a part of the success and the problem solving of how do we get here? How do I empower this family to be able to empower this child? Those we have control over. So when somebody says, I don't know how you do it, Trish, because some of the obstacles that these kids are facing must be overwhelming. You hear the idea of burnout and I go, you know what? I'm amazed by them because this is their daily. Like, I almost am like, how would I have a right to be burned out in this moment? Like, these are their lives. I appreciate vicarious trauma, right? And so that's one of my specialties. So I appreciate that. But how do I do it? How would I not? 
But in a forum like this where we have all of these people that have the potential to touch a life in so many different areas, that we're looking at every area imaginable within the schools, within the county, within law enforcement, within the community. All of us have the potential to do this for a child. All of this, all of us have the potential to do this to a family. Every one of you right now, if I were to say, think of a child and a family that you could make a difference in your life, in their life, every one of you would be able to think of one. Every one of you would be able to think back and be like, I know somebody right now that probably could use that. We all need to be a part of putting deposits in somebody's piggy bank. We all need to take notice of what people are doing well because I can focus in on the risk factors, but we're living them. We already know it. We know what's out there. We know what we're dealing with. It's what we see every day. What I'm asking you to do is shift it and focus on how to build their confidence. Focus on making sure that your connections are meaningful and that even if you have consequences that have to be followed through, that you have given them an opportunity to have something positive. That you have validated their overwhelming struggles, that you have validated their attempt to try and do what's in the best interest of their child, that you have validated their struggle. Deposit for them. That's where we're going to see the changes. I never know how to do these things. Ta da! Right, it's done. <laughs>
how their bodies absorb everything, how sensitive they are and yet alert, cognizant, and depending on where you have your birthing, whether we, we had some of the kids at the old Booth Maternity, which was on City Line Avenue out near St. Joe's University, and we had a midwife and so on. We had another one at Presbyterian Hospital where they had a birthing room, an actual bed, and the midwife, you know, delivered uh, our child. We had, so we had a couple, and then we had some more cesarean section type cases. Each of them was fascinating to be you know, privy to and to see. But to this day, if you ask me what the most fundamental, uh, fantastic, critical experience of my life was, it was seeing my children born. And, and watching and understanding all of us is that song, and I can't remember whether it's McLaughlin or whatever, we're all born innocent. We are a bundle of sensory nerve endings, and openness, and that the body itself keeps the score, the memory, it's implicit. And that's how it understands and downloads every single sound and touch and so on. Think about that for a minute. Think about what you listen to on the radio. Think about what is on your screens at home. Think about what kids are watching. Think about what they're listening to every day of their life. Interuterine development, Trish was talking about resiliency. The mother of the child's context, her family situation, what she is listening to, what she is eating, how her body's responding to what she's eating is being downloaded into that developing human being. And it's being stored. And what we know from the Adverse Childhood Experiences study is <clears throat> it has tremendous impact on which of the neuropathways get attention to and develop and flourish. A stressed mother produces a stressed child. An addictive context, an abusive context, a chaotic context, a noisy context, produces a noisy brain in a child, a chaotic brain in a child. And Dan Siegel's work on the developing brain, the prefrontal cortex of the brain, the executive functioning of the brain is vertically oriented, and it insists on having a coherent, understandable message. And it's almost impossible for us to understand that the child is learning through sight, its senses, focusing, hearing, and his flesh and his body. Something which most of us, certainly by, I would say, adolescence, have begun to shut down. So when we talk about process addictions or behavioral addictions, some of the more famous people in the field in the last maybe 50 or so years Bill Wilson in 1935 with Alcoholics Anonymous and the consultation with Henry Tybell and Dr. Silkworth came up with two words, obsessive compulsive disorder. Obsessive has to do with thinking about inordinate amounts of time spent, you know, practicing, planning, wondering. The obsessive part, the acting out or in, in some cases, feeling an uncontrollable or irresistible need or desire. If we just begin to think about that, I have grandkids now. We were out the other night, we got some pizza in South Philly, and Alessio, who's a bit of a bull, started up because he wasn't getting what he wanted. He goes <clears throat> like that when he doesn't get what he wants. And my daughter gave him a phone with a video clip on it. Whoop, quieted right down, started watching the video clip. Drives me batshit. I can't understand why anybody, knowing what they know today, and then I look sometimes when I'm visiting, and I see the parents saying to the 14-year-old, do your homework. Meantime, they're both on their social media, and they're texting, and they're adding things, and they're on Facebook, and they're liking stuff. 
What are kids growing up with? What's, what's happening to them in their developmental process and the culture at large that we live in? And who's driving it? That's what that little movie is about in terms of beginning at birth to tether our children in neurobiological, visual, emotional, chemical processes, even in the food that we feed them. Almost all American food that's not organically grown, picked, cleaned, and prepared has food additives in it. It has artificial ingredients, it has all kinds of things that download into the body's memory. So, mac and cheese, right? Why, mac and cheese sucks. Why do we think it's so great? We've been having it shoved down our throats since we were little kids. It's cheap, inexpensive way, right? What's a buck 19? When you show kids mac and cheese that has Mickey Mouse on the box, and that's what this film is about, the kid says, that's what I want. I, I want that one. And the parent says, well, how do you know that? Like, did you ever have it? No, but I know it's the best because it has Mickey Mouse on it. That's screwed up. What the film goes on to say is that's intentional. They have marketing people that follow these kids into their bedrooms, the toilet, the kitchen. They have parties for three-year-olds in which they come over and they ask them why they particularly like this or what looks like that. And the representative from Madison Avenue in the film says, some people ask me about the ethics of these things. She said, this is a consumer market, a consumer world, and the sooner you get to your consumers, the better off you have, because you have them for life. Duh. So what do we expose our children to? Think about it. How many of you have been to Chuck E. Cheese? What is Chuck E. Cheese? What is it? It's a nightclub <laughs> where, where kids go and gamble. They don't have strippers and things like that. What are we doing? Do you remember the arcades down the shore on the boardwalk? What are we doing? We're, get, we're gambling. We're teaching our kids how to gamble. I mean, it's, it's insanity. So it's not, it, it's not so much like a question of what is a process addiction. The word addiction. How many think they have a good grasp of the word addiction? You think you do? What is it? What's that mean? Does that, does that mean I keep eating mac and cheese? Or like, what, what, does, what does that, I know it's a good, it's, it's the, the ASAM I'm going to pull up in a minute. But what, what does that tell me about a behavioral? What's a behavioral activity? What am I doing when I'm behaving or misbehaving? Good behavior. I'm interacting with people, places, and I'm doing something. In fact, uh, Stanton Todd, he sneered at the thought of substance or chemical addictions and behavioral addictions. The last time I drank, I had a like, I, it was a behavior. I had to go buy it. I had to pour it out. I had to socialize or function with others. I, I was doing something. Halloween last night, uh, the other night rather, um, down in South Philly, we went out with the kids for a couple hours, my daughter and, uh, and, and her children. And almost every block, there was lots of candy, really nice people, and guess what else was there? Alcohol. So the other thing, when we talk about these addictions, and you can categorize them, there's some really wonderful little websites, the School of Life, and there's some other things. And if you just Google up, like, process or behavioral addictions, and they cluster them into groups. So what's happening to the toddler, the infant, the child, who's being given food loaded with additives, oftentimes sugar, which is probably one of the premier addictive substances in this culture, a mind-altering, mood-altering substance, which one becomes dependent upon. While he's watching or she's watching cartoons, maybe Dora the Explorer, which also, if you notice on Dora the Explorer, 
has an unnecessary cursor all the time on the screen. That's conditioning the child to click and move around and click. And so she's getting set up for when she gets her iPad. Guess whose children doesn't have an iPad and didn't have an iPad? Anybody want to guess? Steve Jobs. He said, there's no way I'm giving my kid an iPad. He said at an event in 2010, and this is a book, if some of you haven't seen it, it's, it's really worth, I mean, at least the beginning part. Um, it's called Irresistible by Adam Alter. And it, it's got some really basically good stuff if you want to wrap your head around these kinds of addictions. This is what Steve Jobs unveiled with the iPad. What this device does is extraordinary. It offers the best way to browse the web, way better than a laptop, way better than a smartphone. It's an incredible experience. It's phenomenal for mail. It's a dream to type on. For 90 minutes, he explained why the iPad was the best way to look at photos, listen to music, take classes on iTunes. You browse Facebook, play games, navigate thousands of apps. He believed everyone should own an iPad, but he refused to let his kids have one. Jobs told the New York Times journalist Nick Bolton that his children had never used the iPad. We limit how much technology our kids use in our home. I had a relationship or friendship with the advertising director of what was then Channel 17, when they still called them UHF stations. And I remember going to meet with him one day at his office out in Overbrook. And on, on the coffee table in his office, there was a magazine and it was targeting different ethnic groups and what kind of content you want to show them. And for one particular group, it was sex and violence. I think that would just about cover everybody anymore. When we left, he did not have cable. He said he never would. And he doesn't let his kids watch television. So <clears throat> these are things that we're so complacent about because we ourselves are conditioned to and he goes on, Adam, talking about cell phone use. Think for a minute, how, how much time do you spend interfacing with your cell phone, checking, looking at mail? Does anybody know? Does anybody have the app that tells you? You got the app? You don't want to say it, do you? Why not? This, this is your life, right? You get it once, I'm getting cut up in little bits and pieces before they put me in the box. But um, it's going to be over. And, and I'm sure that I won't be able to take all my videos and selfies and acquired files with me into the casket. What are we doing? I took my daughters, we, I, I just came back from a conference for the treatment of sexual abusers and I met Two of my kids came to see me up there, and we went, we went into a national forest, which was really quite lovely on Sunday, and we're, we're in these magnificent trails with these big gorges and fantastic scenery, and you know what they're doing? They're like, Dad, get this, and they're taking selfies the whole time, and they're making faces, and I'm thinking, that's really strange. Why are we doing that? And then I think, is that any stranger than my mother-in-law? trying to control the whole function by taking pictures every 10 minutes and telling people where to stand, get together, hold it, like all day long. So in some ways, I think of behavioral addictions, any addictions, as, as aside from being an attachment disorder to something, which is being used to avoid something, or to fill the void in that they're not getting what they need, it becomes a replacement. It's a surrogate. And what the American society, that, that little handout I gave you, if nothing else today, if you take that away, I have, I'll sit with a client and I'll use a whole session to read through that article with them, or her, or the parents. And I'll say to them, like, do you understand what the music is doing to your child? One of the other films is Killing Us Softly. If you're listening to, to music and it's talking about hoes and bitches and getting fucked and bitches and doing, what are we doing? What the hell are we doing? What are the images that Walt Disney, even Pocahontas, is really hot there? 
And even the animal creatures, look at them. They all have breasts, don't they? What's that about? What the hell are we showing our kids? What are we exposing them to? And then think about the eating disorders in our culture. We're perpetrating them. In that, it talks about the amount of obesity, diabetes, hypertension, gastric disorders in children. The online screening, I mean, I remember when it was bad with Sesame Street. And I still, I still remember the kid's mother putting them down in front of Sesame Street to occupy them. And then I thought Fred Rogers at least was one of the non-toxic, although they've managed to commercialize him also now, where at least he feigned relationship. The heart of all addiction and compulsive behavior is not a choice. It's no choice. We are designed to be relational. We are triadic from conception. And when those very primary, primordial objects aren't available to our psyches, our souls, that little baby's not able to be mirrored back how beautiful she is, she develops her own internal self. She dissociates. In many households, I don't care where you live, I don't care what color your skin is, what your ethnicity is, what your religious background is, I see it all at every level. The abuse, the neglect, the things that deplete any possibility of resiliency in a child's sense of their self. I see the consistent deconstruction of culture, community, social organizations that would somehow beef up a child's sense of self, idealism, moral principles, sense of ethos, belonging. Where is that? Who's taking care of that? I won't get into that. Some of our more regarded social institutions have failed us miserably, and they're continuing to. Where does the kid take him or herself? Where do we take ourselves? How many men, don't raise your hands, look at porn? Have looked at porn? How many women are now looking at porn? What's that doing in terms of forming, sexualizing, and teaching our youth? What did it do to my generation? Now, we started out at least with Playboy. So we had age-appropriate age people to look at. And while we didn't know much about Photoshop and dressing things up, our imagery was generally compliments of you, Hefner. Who do you think people read more and looked more at? You Hefner's portrayal of women or Pope John Paul II's theology of the body? How many in here have read the theology of the body? Somebody, somebody was talking about these two huge events, that, that the one was expressing the glory of the human body, the nature of sexuality and erotica and so forth, and the other was objectifying and commodifying. We get stuck on the sex part. How else do we commodify people? What's with the sweat and the workout places? And what's, what's the other one where, where people become obsessed? I have anorexic men clients who go work out. Their feet, the bottoms of their feet are damaged from the jogging. They also have peculiar smells sometimes because they're binging and purging, I think. And they're, they're irregular bowel movements and what they're trying to do. And <clears throat> it looks it and you can see it. And they're obsessed with what they're going to do next. There's a woman in one of these little clips, TED Talk, who talks about getting, I forget the name of the little instrument, it's a pedometer. It talks about how many feet you're supposed to walk, and I forget how many thousand steps. And she became compulsive about it, and even with her kids at home, she couldn't sit down anymore. She was constantly trying to titrate up the number of steps she took every day. So what's, what's happening to the human organism is important. And that, that handout I gave you, um, I, I like this definition. I was trying to find a definition years ago for a, a national conference that I would do every year. 
And I couldn't find like a non-clinical or DSM-4 or 3 or 5 definition. And I thought this is great. They did this. Given, given up, surrendered, given to. How many of us, between diet, social exposure, interfacing with the media, recreational activities, music in our houses, are literally selling our kids' souls? We are. I've done it. We, that's what we're doing. So when we talk about prevention, it's, it's kind of like asking. Einstein said, don't ask the people who created the problem to fix it. Do you ever notice when Congress or the White House or something tries to fix a dilemma? It usually gets much worse, and it's very expensive. Institutions that try to clear up sexual abuse and spend like $20 million, and they come out telling you uh, they're going to put glass doors on the offices or something. What is it that's missing? And Margaret Mead, in 1971, at, at a conference at the White House on youth, and gave a talk called Culture and Commitment, she said the hardest part to change in the culture is not the children. The hardest cohort to change in the culture are the adults. And the rapidity with which our culture changes technologically, sociologically, economically, visually, demographically, think about it. I'm 65. I remember horse-drawn hucksters in Logan in Philadelphia where I grew up. I remember the trolleys that one of our illustrious mayors decided to rip up and cover with asphalt. So now you have to go to Austria to enjoy them. What were those things that connected people? How, how do I tell my grandson about that? I don't. I have very little capacity to. Do I hand him these kinds of devices and things and opportunities? What do I do? What does the school, you know, the school's just lost a contract. You know the screens that you see out there in the cafeteria? They had them in school buses. And they were marketing to kids in school buses. And they had them in kindergartens at the beginning of the day in announcements. And it was just this past year that one of the, I don't know whether it was the state Supreme Court or whoever it was, stopped it. And the parents said, no, I don't want you marketing my five-year-old. Because the principal got a couple of extra bucks, I suppose, or maybe it was her brother who was the marketeer. How many of you have been to the dentist lately? How many have noticed there's screens in the dentist's office? You're sitting down, son of a bee is drilling your teeth, and you're being marketed. And the last time I went for a cleaning, about six months ago, I said, what's with the screen? And the tech, she was nice, she said, I don't like it. I said, why would I like it? This sucks. I hate coming to the dentist, and I certainly don't want to be marketed to and listen to your crap music while I'm in the dentist chair paying you. And then the dentist came in, and he was all indignant. I said, this is crap. What are you doing? Like, you're, you're abusing people. Because most of us, I'm a good Irish Catholic kid, you know, you don't say anything to the doctor, do you? I do. It took me a long time. Turn it off. Like, what do you want me to do? Turn it off. So you turn it off. So when you get in a fight with your significant other, or your kids, or your baby's father or mother, what do you tell them when the kids are being exposed? Process addictions, if I, and I'm not, I don't need to shame anybody, but if I take my kids to McDonald's, is that a good parental task? How many watched Super Size Me? I have not had anything at McDonald's since I watched that movie. My younger children, who are much brighter, I think, more competent than my older children, have, they, they haven't eaten at McDonald's since we showed them that film. They used to like to go and get the front, but they don't go. All right. So <clears throat> if I go, we have, and we work with men who are sexual addicts, by definition, their sexuality has gotten out of control. They have very problematic, troubling, sometimes illegal behaviors. They engage in things that are devastating to their health, their wife's health, their children's health. They will put their kids in the back seat of the car and cruise for prostitutes. 
they will go and act out, sometimes same sex, sometimes with, you know, she males, whatever, have unprotected sex, come back home and have unprotected sex with their children's mother. Now, think about, or the mistress from the Northwest who talked about having at least six one to seven ongoing relationships with men, no protection, and the one man was going home and having sex with his wife who was breastfeeding the baby, and she found out she had gonorrhea. Process addictions have to do with continuance in spite of adverse consequences. It's the kid. When I take Giovanni's phone from him, I have to protect myself. 30 years ago, when I turned the TV off with my daughter Megan, who's now like 37, 38, or took the remaining Mike and Ikes from her, I was at risk. She would stamp her feet, scream, sometimes get really volatile, and then she was fine. So this, what the, the Addictions Medicine Society is talking about is, you're not just temporarily altering your state. Over a protracted period of time, you're altering your brain. The neurobiology and the white matter in the brain, which is in your prefrontal cortex, is where your discretionary system works. Addiction beats it down. So you no longer have clarity. Do you remember what Bill Clinton, I'm old enough to remember, I was I remember running the sex addiction unit back then when he got in trouble with Monica. Do you remember what he said? Anybody? I did not have sexual relations with that woman at the level of press, radio, and film. Hillary was right next to him. And for God's sake, man, I guess in a way he didn't have sexual relations. He was putting cigars in her and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. But I don't know that it was very relational. But there's the President of the United States who traumatized his whole staff. And I have, because I have nothing better to do with my life, I read those reports. The grand I read it all. And the people that were most harmed and affected by that were his staff. They were forced to lie, make crap up. It cost us $52 million. And the, the one thing, and I voted for him, I was a big, but the one thing he never got in trouble for after that was discovered, it wasn't the Monica thing that bothered me. He dropped bombs in a Nigerian pharmaceutical company without any reason to. An act of war to kind of take our mind off things. Behavioral addictions are distractions. These things are distractions. We are tethered to our phones, to our iPads, to our computers. My company which is not poor, and our owner makes a lot of money. He gives me this, and I give him my weekends and nights. Now you go figure that out. That's not really very intelligent, is it? So these things make, even for the corporate world, an amazing, amazing instrument of making us very servile and indentured. When I started out in Medicaid managed care at a place called Mustard Seed a long time ago in Philadelphia, we had these big bulky phones and we had pagers and things like that. And they paid us for being on call. I don't know anybody that gets paid for being on call now. Work addictions. How many feel at least they've had a smell of that? Come on, there's got to be some really good Catholic people here who at the end of the day, when you've done all you can, don't ask for any reward. You'll receive it in the next life. What do workaholics get from their work? It's, it's one of the most powerful, destructive addictions that a human being can experience. In terms of the immune system, relational systems, spirituality, meaning making, energy systems, <clears throat> when I get somebody, and I had a guy walk in my office a couple of, I guess, about four weeks ago now, and he literally could barely talk, the lawyer, and he's obsessed with his kids' college tuitions and the firm that he's working for, sleeping two to three hours a week from anxiety, losing tons of weight, <clears throat> and the first thing, I sent him to a psychiatrist and, and got him at least a little bit um, stabilized with, with medication. And then, and then we just started on the process of stopping. 
Here's, here's a relatively simple prescription. How many of you have tried to stop doing something that you continued to do in spite of it not being what you wanted to do or that you knew wasn't good for you? Just one person, three. Do you know the, the infamous quote from St. Augustine and his predecessor, St. Paul, why do I do the things I know I ought not to do? And the things that I do or the things that I don't do are the things I know I ought to do. It's the divided self. I guess what I'm saying is the, the culture that we live in conditions us from the point of view that each of us, and I don't know if you'll appreciate this, but you know, how many think the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation is a nonprofit, on our side institution? It's not. It's proprietary. It makes us commodities, and we're collateral on the national market. You realize that? That's how sick that is. Most of us are so dumb, we think that it insures our money in the bank, right? That's what I always thought. That's not what it is. Every one of us is bartering material. We're collateral for the multinational corporate 1%. How do you keep people that dumbed down? How do you do that? You keep them busy. You distract their attention. You tweet, right? I know somebody who does a lot of tweeting, and everybody pays attention. Does that help any? Does that stop? the abuse that's going on. The latest is somebody born in this country doesn't become an, a naturalized citizen right away. It's almost, unco it is unconstitutional. Being signed into an executive order, so we're all gonna get our phones out, we're gonna listen to NPR and we're gonna talk about it. We've become impotent. We've been so co-opted and our relationships so challenged and hijacked. What the American Society of Addictions Medicine is saying is, we don't want to feel or go through the rigors of self-discipline. And the restoration, once we give the kid the phone, how do you take it away from him? Does it, any of you know the art form, right? You're in the front pew of church and the kid's acting out and he's got, he's got your keys and he's slamming them into the nice refinished pew. What's, what's the one thing you don't do? You don't take the keys without giving them something else, right? All right, so in, in these behavioral addictions and process addictions, what are you going to give? And I think my, the, the previous presenter spoke a good deal about this. What, what are you supposed to do or be either for yourself, for a partner, a husband, spouse, a child, a grandchild? What are you supposed to do? Do you ever, do you ever watch the adults? I love this, especially when they're crossing Broad Street. And they're looking at the phone, they're dragging the two-year-old, and he's like playing with something else. That's, that's awful. Think about that. How many in here have texted and driven? Come on. Let's face it, folks. That's a life-defying, life-threatening thing to do. In Vietnam, the Vietnamese physicians have declared it an endemic uh, health issue in the country because people are texting and riding their motorcycles and they're dying in inordinate numbers. Think about that. How do you drive and text? Do you ever, like, I'm a yellow road rage sometimes, you know? And you're driving along and all of a sudden the traffic's slowing down. You're on 95, there's nothing ahead, there's nothing behind, no accidents, it doesn't seem like anything's wrong. And you see all these people slowing down and you're getting, uh, you know, all, all bogged down. And then you get up there and you see somebody who's, who's staring into the phone. On an interstate highway where people are driving up to 85 miles an hour. And, and what do you think they're texting about? The one guy we had, he was, he, he did, we had them go through a list of things they do. And it's a very unusual thing at, at Keystone, but they do inventories. And in the group, it's all men, they put out there everything they do. You don't want to hear it, you know, believe me. But the one guy, he did his bad behavior, his deviant or compulsive or whatever behavior. And then I said, what about the sexting while you're driving? And he goes, oh yeah, I went around the circle in Jersey and totaled the car. 
I could have killed somebody. These are the kinds of conditions or things when you ask yourself about an addictive process. Is it something that I have control over? Am I compulsive about it? Am I able to stop or do I continue to do it? I've worked really hard because I have two phones and I'm so important not to text in the car. Even if I'm the passenger. Why do I need to do that? What possible reason do I have to do that? I don't. So my best thinking in that addictive process, because how long have we had cell phones now? How long would you say, 20 years? Yeah, the internet and Wi-Fi is only like 25, 30 years old, it's not that old. How did people function for five million years for God's sake? What did they do? I remember when the phone was on the wall and you had a row to dial it and you had party lines and a lot of times grandma would like break her hip getting down the stairs to answer the phone because the party line person was using it and you didn't sue her, you know, you didn't sue the other person. But you, you were constantly involved with other people, not just these silly machines. How many of you know exactly what you're paying each month for your cell phone bill? You don't look happy about it. How much are you paying for your cell phone? Our cell phone bill is higher than the mortgage on my house in 1980 when I was living in Logan in Philadelphia. That's sick. So why am I paying that? Why am I paying for my kids' phones? Why do I keep getting added char charges for usages? None of them are in business. Not about that. I don't know, are they streaming? Looking at porn? I don't know what they're doing. Why am I paying for it? Anybody have an answer why I'm doing that? Why, why do I, when my youngest daughter is now 19, was, was 10, was having a nervous breakdown because her, all her friends had iPhones and she didn't. And she needed an iPhone. You know, this is what I do for a living. I work with addiction. I work with people who go to jail because of their iPhones. Young men who have never even had sex in their life that have gone to jail. And the father says to me, the one guy, I, I can't take Anthony's cell phone from him. And I looked at him, I said, for God's sake, he's, he's got federal charges. He was acting out with somebody and, you know, sexting pictures, underage. What are you talking about? He was a relatively bright man, business guy up in New York, and he didn't get it. Another, another kid who was in treatment, in trouble, and this is something to really be aware of, how, how bad it is. And when the father came to visit him, they went out for lunch. This is a kid under federal indictment. The father gave him the phone. And the father was a bright bulb, he wasn't stupid, but he was an idiot. Why, why would you give your kid that phone? And the second time, he was discovered, and he used, guess what he used the phone for? Yeah, and he, he, he got caught, because he was being observed. How do you take your son to jail when you do that? So I guess the, the, the thing for me, in, in terms of a culture, that's very, very disturbed at the point. And some people would call us a, a culture of addictive behavior and dependency. Um, Gabor Mate in the realm of hungry ghosts, did you ever see his addicted to power? I can't show anything on here, I wanted to. Uh, Gabor Mate, in, he's down in Argentina I think, and he gives this magnificent talk. I, I've actually seen him talk, he's very profound. He treats heroin addicts up in Vancouver, British Columbia. He says, who are we kidding? We're looking at the heroin addict, we're looking at, at what these people do to their lives. And he says, look at what we're doing to our world. Did you ever see the crap we're putting into the ocean? Did you ever look at what we're dumping into our landscape? Did you ever see the garbage we're putting into our kids' heads? Why? The absolute garbage, pounding it, pounding it, and pounding it in, in music, 
in visuals, in TV shows, in movies, in Netflix. And we're paying for it, for God's sake. What the hell are we doing? We think about it. And then we give them snacks. I'll never forget, I used to teach at Roman Catholic down in Broad and Vine in 1990. We used to take the kids that got thrown out of the public schools back in the day. And I remember just, just thinking about what we were doing to kids and the worlds that we were allowing them to grow up in and the incredible abuse and neglect and then what we fed them. You've read all the reports, I'm sure, about soda, right, corn, corn syrup and all the other different things. You can go into the most affluent school system in the country and what are you going to find in the cafeteria? My, my four-year-old uh, grandson, he's over in China, he, he says, are we going to go have crap for lunch today, Daddy? Are you going to eat crap food? And um, four years old, he knows what's crap and what's good. We feed our kids crap. I'll never forget when Trident Sugarless Gum came out. Remember, some of you remember, I, I'm old enough to remember. You know what it said on the side of the pack of gum? Caution, may be carcinogenic. <laughs> we were buying it for our kids and giving them this gum that says, caution may cause cancer. So what, what ASAM is saying in this, in this process of things, oops, is, is that addiction is not in the substance. It's not in the food. It's not in, it's in the culture. It's in the human being and the human soul that by nature is meant to be relational and connected. That constantly looks and negotiates to be in relationship and finds itself somehow cut off, somehow estranged. Eric Erickson, many, many years ago, the famous sociologist and psychologist, he said, show me an ancient child, or anxiety-ridden child, and I'll show you an anxiety-ridden mother. Men get away with a lot, but we too communicate our anxiety to our children, our isolation, our loneliness. Pornography is a way of acting out for men against women generally. Women are catching up, but very slowly. The feminist literature on pornography suggests that Pernorn is a very keen way of looking into the male mind. What's happening in porn is angry men abusing, controlling, manipulating, denigrating the feminine. And not just the feminine, but youth and children. About a third of some of these websites have to do with children. And you're talking billions and billions of dollars. Some of them live video cams. The pornography thing is of interest to me because I, I, I don't know, and oftentimes when you grapple with it, how, how someone progresses. And so we talk about a, you know, a primary chronic progressive illness with biological, psychological, and environmental factors that contribute to that addictive process. What I'm suggesting is even in utero development is a contributing factor to the predisposition to addict. If a child is an ancient mess, I keep saying ancient, he is ancient, I guess. If he's an anxious mess and you give him something sedative, he feels relief. Addiction, whether it's chemical, visual, food, whatever it happens to be, whether you ingest it, visualize it, hear it, or touch, like sex addiction and that need for tactile touch, it's inevitably a way to obtain pain, loneliness, sadness, anxiety, or fear. It's what we do. We compensate. For the adolescent, it can be a way to get back at people in terms of being angry at parents. When I taught at Roman, I used to, I remember kids would say, Mr. Morton, I'm going to show you. I'm going to flunk. <laughs> Go ahead, George. And he would flunk just to let me know that I couldn't help him. So adolescence, addiction is a negative or destructive entitlement in a relationship to act out. Screw her. Screw him. Most extramarital activities and relationship activities, I think, are done out of anger, sometimes rage. 
What people do is they override their best judgment, their best sense of self, and they're always compensating. And so the other part in terms of prevention, how do we take away? How do we stop? How do we pay attention to our intuitive spirituality and natures? And there's a great religious healer, um, I can't think of his name from Africa, and he's in a, he's in a documentary, and he's being interviewed about human intuition, and, and the, the interviewer's fin finished, and she says, so what, what is it, what is it? And as, as he's about to answer, the phone rings, and he starts laughing. He says, noise. Everywhere you go, you got noise. There's no quiet. There's no opportunity to be with yourself. There's no chance to listen. And the invalidation of self is the hallmark of the addict who feels completely inadequate. Whether it's the President of the United States or whether he's homeless on the streets, he feels inadequate. He compensates. He's outrageous many times. He controls maybe even a whole country or continent. But at the heart of it, he thinks he's a piece of excrement that the world revolves around. And that is not a pleasant metaphor. And I always add, it doesn't flush. So our tolerance as a culture for addictive behaviors, uninvited influences, intrusive aspects electronically in our food chain, in our relationships, in our music, in our visuals, even in our literature, is profound. So if you don't feel hopeless yet, there is, there is a way to deal with this. And I'll end on this note. What, what do you do when you have something so overwhelming? What do we ask kids to do? Stop! Turn it off! Pull the plug! What will happen if we do? I want to say, there's very few people I see looking at their phones. When I teach the city of Philadelphia, I do ethics for their care managers, and it starts out a little rough, about 100 people. And I'll keep saying to them, put the phones away. <laughs> and then I go around, put the phones on. Um, but they survive. I would, I would challenge you to stop, not to start with someone else, but to start with yourself stopping and pay attention to what happens to you and potentially in you. And I guarantee you that your life, even in a little way, will begin to be different. And without that, I don't think there is any hope. I think until people stop and until they're willing, and that's what the addictions treatment field is about, is cessation. In order to allow the brain, the soul, and the body, like the native Indian who gave his talk up in Canada a week ago, it was heartrending, who had been abused in, in the orphanages, in the schools, by the clergy, missionaries, and talked about what happened to him, racism. Then he talked about reservations, the Royal Mounted Police, and the schools, the reform, not reform, what am I saying? Residential schools where he was molested and, and uh, exploited. And he said the healing in the Canadian indigenous peoples is about the soul. Health is doing what's best for you. And it's an integrative process. And I was, I was looking at 1,200 therapists, right? Half of them are looking at their iPhones. This guy's pouring his heart out, telling an incredibly profound, emotionally packed story. And they're looking at their goddamn iPhones. They missed it because they weren't present. So we need to pay attention and be present. And I think, again, uh, what Trish said, you have, you have to be available. So at the end of the day, it's in the eyes of the other that I come to know myself. And even if the particular people I should be being seen by aren't available, I can be. And if I'm willing, ready, and able, if I'm available, there's possibility of that. So anyway, that's my spiel. I, I hope I didn't overbearingly go from the soapbox. And um, I'd be happy to share any of this other stuff. Um, so I didn't slide abuse you today. But I'd be happy to send you stuff if you want it or if you have an interest in it. Um, 
And just think about that today. Think about the four hours we're going to spend on our iPhones. Try to do like only three. And, and just think about how much of our life gets co-opted by this. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, I'm also, I'm Dana Rajko from the Delaware County Office of Behavioral Health, and I'm a prevention program specialist. And I'm going to introduce Kim Porter. She's the executive director of Be Part of the Conversation. She served as the community liaison and parent coordinator for the conversation since 2011 and was named executive director in 2014. Kim also holds the credentials of a certified family recovery specialist. That's designed to help adults who have been directly impacted by another person's substance use disorder by sharing their lived experiences with other families to provide recovery support services. With more than 25 years experience in graphics and marketing, she's happy to put all that creative energy and to be part of the conversation's mission, which is to address substance use, addiction, and its impact on individuals and families by building a culture of awareness and support. You can find more information about being part of the conversation right over here on our resource tables. And Kim, thank you for being here with us today. Good afternoon, everyone. I have the coveted post-lunch position. Yay, I've got, the, I've got it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, so thanks for being here. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about our organization. Um, Be a part of the conversation started about seven and a half years ago up in Montgomery County in the Hacker Horsham School District. Uh, we learned pretty quickly that people wanted to learn all they could about substance use disorders on a community level, and so we start. Can you guys hear me okay? I heard there's a lot of, like, is that okay? Better if I'm here? Is that better? Or is that better? Anybody? Is that good? Like that? Okay. So we. We do these programs that raise awareness about substance use. Um, we started off really talking about, you know, when people are really in struggles, have a family member who's struggling, that sort of thing. But then we were being approached more and more to do some preventative work. So we've been educating parents whose kids are really young, like K through five parents, because you know you really can't start talking about substance use too soon, too early, because is there any one of us who doesn't know someone? friend, relative, neighbor who struggles with addiction, alcoholism, some kind of process addiction. Uh, so it's been really wonderful to start engaging these very young families and arming them with um, how to have those difficult conversations with their children. So here's our mission. Um, we are now in five counties doing lots of kinds of presentations about um, about vaping, which we're going to talk about today, about marijuana. We have something coming up I'll talk to you about in a bit. Certainly talk quite a lot about the opioid crisis. We also address pathways to recovery and all kinds of good things. We have, um, our table is over there with a big stand. Um, we have a sign-up sheet. If you want to give us your email address, we'd be happy to send us, send you the PowerPoint if you would like to have this information. So you, if you see any stats that you want, you can get it um, from us via email, and we'll send that to you. Um, you can also sign up to receive our emails uh, that we send up periodically to let you know about programs that we have coming up. So why is it so important that we're talking about teenagers? Obviously, that's the purpose of looking at the PAYS survey and all the data that you've collected. Well, we know through lots and lots of years of research that anyone who begins using a substance before they're 18 has a one in four chance of becoming addicted to some kind of substance. If we can wait until we're over the age of 21, preferably 25, but over the age of 21, that drops to one in 25, a 1 in 25 chance of becoming addicted to a substance. So obviously, all of us would have much better odds if we would wait until we're 21. And I think this crowd probably knows this, but I'm going to do it anyway. This is how the brain develops from the back to the front. Physical coordination is the first thing that we develop as a very young child. Next to come is emotions. Children have very healthy emotions, sometimes unhealthy emotions, but they're certainly present. Um, motivation is there. Kids need to be motivated. Kids need to be open to learning things like language and sports and music and arts and all sorts of things. But what comes with that is some risk-taking. So we know certainly that young people 
um, are, are taking a lot of chances and they are very much living for it today, instant gratification, that kind of thing. So that's sort of the accelerator part of the brain that's working very, very well. What's not working so well is the brakes. That's the prefrontal cortex, that's the part of our brain that has executive function that says this is probably a bad idea. That doesn't really get fully developed until we're 25 years old. So when we say, what were these kids thinking? They weren't, they weren't thinking about outcomes. They weren't thinking, if I do this, then that will happen. So parents need to be the prefrontal lobe, right? Parents and, and the other adults in our kids' lives. Uh, so why is it that some people become addicted to any kind of substance, any kind of process or behavioral addiction, and others do not? Well, this is a very basic definition three legs, we can talk about genetics, looking at the family tree, psychosocial, emotional, is there any kind of uh, diagnosed or undiagnosed condition that, that is being self-medicated, um, and then of course environmental, like what's the access, what's the exposure to substances or, or in unhealthy behaviors. All of these things are exacerbated again by the age of the onset of use. The younger we are, the more vulnerable we are. Uh, one more stat to throw at you, um, of all the adults that they've surveyed um, who have some sort of addiction, whether they're in recovery or not, 90% of them started using a substance before they were 18 years old. So, let's get into vaping. We were not talking about this two years ago, maybe a little bit. My son was vaping two years ago because he was trying to stop smoking cigarettes. Finally, he stopped vaping too, thank God. I have a son who's in recovery, by the way, which is why I do this work. Uh, he, he, he pulled me into this world, and I'm actually happy to be of service and help in other families as much as I can to, to try to understand this. But back to vaping. Vapes, vaporizers, vape pens, hookahs, electric cigarettes, e-cigarettes, e-pipes, these are all part of the ENDS, which is the Electronic Nicotine Delivering System. Um, vaping is what we kind of generally call all these things but we're definitely going to talk about jeweling in just a moment. Um, this was initially introduced as harm reduction. So if you were an adult who was chain smoking cigarettes or who had tried so many times to quit smoking traditional cigarettes, this might be a way to titrate off or stop completely with you know, the um, free-based nicotine um, and get it in this way instead. But um, what we're seeing now is even adults who are vaping weren't necessarily using it for harm reduction. Um, about one third of people, adults vaping today, are were not using it as a way to get off of traditional cigarettes. I don't know, I'm wondering if perhaps these were people who quit smoking many years ago and had been kind of white knuckling it and then these cigarettes came along like, oh, this is what I love, but it's harmless now. Well, maybe not. We're not so sure how harmless it is. It certainly seems to be a better alternative to um, you know, traditional tobacco products. Okay, so I'll talk about jeweling in just a second, but here's just a little bit of a basic anatomy of an e-cigarette. Basically, when you draw in from it, when you take that drag, it lights up, the battery is activated, and it, and it lights that up. And by the way, you know, vapor can't be created in that little thing without a lot of chemicals, which we'll, I'll show you a few of those in just a second. But to make vapor, you would have to heat water to like 900 degrees. So that's obviously not going to happen with something you can slip into your pocket after you draw from it. So, um, so there's, that's why we have all these chemicals in here. <clears throat> these are kind of looking from left to right, the earlier models that we first started seeing that were just look like a cigarette, they were disposable, and they've kind of graduated into the, you see over toward the, oops, I thought that was a pointer, uh-oh, what did I do? Um, over to the right you see like the tank mod kit that has a bigger battery in it so it gives you kind of that bigger, thicker cloud of vape. You, some, you see somebody at a stoplight roll down their window and the big cloud comes out of the car, they might have a mod. And then over on the right is a jewel pen, which we'll talk about in just a minute. I'm not going to spend too much time on looking at these charts. I'm sure you've seen most of these. I did want to kind of zoom in to look at these numbers um, here in Delaware County. I'm having a hard time saying it myself. Um, but there's definitely been a spike um, in, in e-cigarette use, and they haven't compared this to monitoring the future specifically, so a little bit, but not all of it. So I'm going to talk about that in a second, too. Um, this is looking at what are you vaping. I don't know if you probably can't see that because I can barely see it up here, but 
Over to the right is the I don't know column. I find that really interesting. They're really, and, and we know that they're not, not really sure. Most people don't realize, I think someone mentioned this earlier, that Juul products are all nicotine. That's the, every single Juul product has nicotine in it. So most people, or many people don't even uh, realize that. But here, this is coming from, um, if you see any of my slides that have this black bar at the bottom, that's coming from the Monitoring the Future survey from 2017. And these pretty much reflect what you're seeing here in Delaware County. Uh, there's, there's just a lot of misunderstanding or misinformation about what it is they're, they're vaping. So they've got some high numbers about what they don't know as well. So here's Juul. This was just recently published, uh, you know, looking at the market for Juul products. They are by far the leading um, product out there for vaping. Kids call it Juuling now. It's become a term that's used for vaping, uh, and it's very, very popular with them. Here's what they look like if you haven't seen them. And by the way, um, Judy Hirsch is over there. She's our program coordinator. And oh, she's holding up a sample for you. So you're welcome to go over and take a look at our little stash over there. We have a few different samples of things. Um, but basically the parts are, you can see you get a starter kit. The starter kits right now are about $35 to $45. Um, they're, they're available online. You can charge it into your laptop right there. It's, you can see how basically the size of it. It's very, very discreet. Um, I'm hearing a lot from educators. The kids are vaping in class. They'll exhale into their backpack, up the sleeve, whatever it is. It dissipates pretty quickly. It doesn't smell like smoke or marijuana, even if it is marijuana, which we'll talk about. Um, so it's pretty easy to use in a lot of places that we wouldn't normally get away with smoking a cigarette or a joint. One little Juul pod has the same amount of nicotine as one to two packs of cigarettes. It's a lot of nicotine. And kids are incredibly cavalier about this. Some of them talk about going through one or two pods a day. That's a lot of nicotine. Nicotine is probably our most addictive substance. I mean, really different. How many people have just, have, have abstain from every other substance that they used to abuse but can't stop smoking, right? They've stopped heroin, they've stopped other drugs that can't stop smoking. It is so addictive. And here we are introducing this highly addictive substance to that developing teenage brain. And when I hear uh, from my friend who's a SAP coordinator that parents are buying their kids e-cigarettes because they hear it helps with anxiety, it just makes my head explode, you know? So over on the left, you see that the top left is that jewel pen that we were just looking at. On the bottom is a new product called the Ruby. The Ruby comes with a refillable cartridge. So we can get creative now about what we're putting in the vape pen. So it looks like a jewel. It looks like I'm inhaling nicotine or just flavors. I always see that just flavors. It's on the pay survey. It's on the monitoring the future survey. I wish it would just say flavors and not just flavors because that makes it sound like it's innocuous and it's absolutely not. We're going to talk about that too. Check out the one on the top row in the middle. It looks like an inhaler for asthma. It's for weed. You buy it online. It's for it's for vaping marijuana. <clears throat> Wonder who we're marketing to here, <laughs> right? It's clearly this is the Joe Camel of our generation. You know, uh, Fruit Loops, Mango, Creme Brulee. You know, um, a friend of ours who does this presentation with us says, you know, if only it all tasted like dirt tobacco, you know, we would not have kids doing this as much. And there's even a study that shows that's the number one reason kids say they're vaping is for the flavor. We know why they're vaping, but, it's, but the flavor is what brings them in. And this is what you have to do when you go online. Check a box. Yeah, I'm over 18. I'm over 21. Yes, I'm complying with my state regulations when I order this product. That's all you have to do to order this stuff. So we educate parents a lot about this, and we tell them, you know, check your mail, check your for little packages that come in in the mail um, because your kid might be ordering e-cigarettes. This was a picture that was texted to me by a parent. Uh, she's like, can you tell me what's going on with my daughter? <laughs> There's a lot going on there. She does not have a, a ADHD, and those are that's Adderall up in the top right. She had she made herself a little. Um, so the, the jewel comes with the charger, and it's tiny, and it gets lost really easily. So you can go on YouTube. I found out how to do it. I 
MacGyvered one myself, you just kind of cross some wires from an old iPod charger that has the USB port and you have yourself um, a dual charger. So um, the world is at our fingertips when we have this, as Mike was saying earlier. And uh, so kids can figure out just about anything and so there's an awful lot going on with this young lady. <coughs> So what is in these e-cigarettes after all? So they're not, it's not just vapor, you know, kids have this impression that it's like they're inhaling an atomizer or a vaporizer. It's not like that at all. It's much more like a theatrical fog machine. There are a lot of chemicals in here. Formaldehyde, uh, look at this propylene guy called metal is down at the bottom. Glycerin, you know, again, you can't have this, this cool thick vape that they love to do vape tricks with and stuff without some chemicals involved. We don't know the long-term implications of this. We don't know. Do you remember, does anybody remember popcorn lung from microwave popcorn that had the flavoring that had carcinogens in it and is affecting people's linings of their lungs? We don't know what the flavors are even doing. So when it says just flavors, it's not just, it's not like somebody's pouring orange juice into this thing and lighten it up. So, sorry, I get a little <laughs> snarky about this stuff sometimes because <laughs> kids love it so much. We, we asked some students one time, um, you know, what do you like about it? And they're like, I don't know, it's just easy. Like, and the guy who asked the question said, an apple is easy. Like, this thing, you have to charge it, it's sticky, you got to refill it, it's, it's not easy. But, of course, they love it. Um, and it is an entree into traditional tobacco use. There are all kinds of studies already showing, including the pays, that, you know, we had, we had been working on getting cigarette smoking down. And now we've got kids getting introduced to nicotine a whole new way, and again, being, not being helped at all by the industry that's marketing it to us. So mood-altering uh, substances generally fall into three categories. They could be stimulants, they could be depressants, or they can be hallucinogens. Nicotine is a stimulant. And people have a hard time with this because they're like, yeah, but, I, but it calms me down. Well. It, what it's doing is making you really not care as much about what was stressing you out. It's going right to your brain and it is giving you, um, it's going right to the brain, it's increasing your dopamine and serotonin. So you're feeling calmer, you're feeling more relaxed, but it absolutely is a stimulant. Once you become dependent on it um, and you stop using it, now you're really stressed out. Now you really need to get back to that nicotine and get another hit. So. There, and it's short acting, so you can have that crash very quickly, which is why the dosing is so constant with any kind of nicotine use. I won't get into this too much. Again, you're gonna, if, you, if you want this PowerPoint, we'll send it to you. Um, just give us your email over there. Um, but E6 is an entry to, entree to other substance use. You know, um, during the teen years, nicotine use can actually rewire your brain making your desire to become addicted to other drugs much higher. It impacts the development of that very vulnerable young brain. The reward system gets hijacked, like with any other substance. And look how binge drinking has been decreasing. Yay, this is great news. Kids perceive the risk of binge drinking is going up, so their use is going down. It's a little bit of interesting stuff happening in recent years. It's leveling out a bit. I'm not sure what that's about, but something to keep an eye on. But that's good news. The white line here shows, again, what I was just talking about, cigarette smoking, absolutely declining. Now, this doesn't get into vaping, but it's showing that very steady, slow, kind of a little bit of increase in marijuana use over the years. I'm very anxious to see how this is going to be effective with uh, legalization in Pennsylvania now that we've got it. Starting this past January, um, medicinal marijuana is legal here. so. Let's just talk a little bit. We can't talk about vaping without talking about marijuana because we know for sure that kids are vaping cannabis oil. Um, it's more and more accessible to them, available to them. So um, this is looking, again, at monitoring the future. I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time seeing the slides. Hopefully you can see them better than I can. <clears throat> so marijuana basically has two very interesting chemicals in it. The most interesting, there are hundreds of chemicals in marijuana. But the two most interesting are THC and CBD. THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, is the chemical that gives us the psychoactive feeling, gives us that high. So um, it slows down reaction to time, you know, symptoms like you know, apathy, um, IQ points with regular use can actually decline. 
um, you, you know, that failure to launch that we see so many young people going through. CBD is the other, that's, um, that's cannabidiol, is a cannabinoid, but it does not get you high. So this is what we're really looking at for medicinal properties, you know, anti-seizure, anti-inflammatory, um, perhaps some things with anxiety, some struggles with anxiety does not get you high. In fact, it even counteracts the THC when they're combined, so that the THC isn't quite, doesn't give you the same kind of high that it would without the CBD. <clears throat> so again, talking about those three general categories, we talked about nicotine as a stimulant. Marijuana is actually a mixed action drug. It can be a stimulant, it can be a depressant, and it can also be a hallucinogen. So some may feel paranoid, anxious, energized. That would be the stimulant feeling. Some may feel chilled out or relaxed. That would be the depressant action. And some might have an experience which causes them to dissociate from reality. A lot of this depends on that, that would be the hallucinogen effect. A lot of this depends on if it's sativa or indica, the kind of marijuana that it is, the potency, um, that sort of thing. I don't want to get into a whole marijuana talk. We certainly could do that. Uh, there's plenty to talk about, but um, adolescent uses certainly can cause problems with memory, learning, distorted perception, apathy, as I mentioned, uh, trouble with thinking. You know, it's connection. It's, it's connection. They already have this working against them. And I just hear this over and over and over again from parents of teenagers who are fiercely loyal to their weed. They love it so much, and they don't care about what it's doing to the family at all. The fact that they're disconnected, they're isolating, um, and the families are heartbroken. And it's, it's really tough to hear because our culture is really making it a lot easier for kids to find that it's harmless and okay to use. Uh, today's THC is a whole lot more potent than it used to be. This is not your father's or grandfather's marijuana. THC levels in the 60s and 70s uh, were about at 1%. That's, the, again, the psychoactive chemical in marijuana. In the 80s and 90s, it was at about 3%. Uh, today, THC levels in your basic run-of-the-mill blunt or joint is at about 13%. When you start talking about concentrates and edibles, when I say concentrates, dabbing, wax, butter, all these kinds of words, these are. this is when you take marijuana, cook it down with butane, which in and of itself is a pretty volatile thing to be doing. Um, and you get this waxy resin, and uh, that's that. Now you're talking about like up to 80% THC, so a really concentrated dose of something that is a psychoactive chemical right to the brain. Um, and young people again are it's, there's dripping. You know, you just need a hot instrument to heat up, and then you tap it into the wax or the dabs and inhale it, and that's how you get high. Edible forms or edibles are creating. Did you hear the news just the other day? Some kids were hospitalized because they got their hands on some edible granola bars or something. Um, we have a, I'm going to mention in just a moment, a speaker that we have coming up who's a policy expert on marijuana. He's joining us from Colorado. And, you know, he wrote a book that talks about um, how kids in emergency rooms are showing up because they're getting their hands on gummy bears and all that. It's in soft drinks. They're, I mean, they're marketing this in everything you can possibly consume. So um, I, I really am concerned about what's coming down the road for us here in Pennsylvania. I do believe recreational uh, legalization is probably around the corner. So we have a lot to get educated about. I'm just sharing this with you. This, just last night, I was, um, Judy and I were with some parents at a support group and a mom who has a 16-year-old who's been fighting her on this for so many years already. Um, he loves his marijuana. Um, she went onto this website because he was touting the virtues of one of our local new dispensaries. Um, there are about, I believe, about 50 in operation right now in the state of Pennsylvania. This is, this is one of their websites. I've locked out where it came from. We don't need to go there. But I just want to point, it, point this out. See at the very top, THC, CBD, the weight, and the price. You see, any, this is the first of 11 pages of menu items. Look at the amount of THC in medicinal marijuana, some of these things. I, I'm, I don't want to discredit anybody who sees the value in looking into the medicinal potential for this stuff. If this can help with seizure disorders, this can help with glaucoma, this can help with 
pain, any of those kinds of things, that's awesome. But, but we have to be educated about it and understand what we're doing. You know, these are highly concentrated, almost hard drugs now that are being sanctioned by the state. Um, there's a whole list on the state's uh, website about how to get a medical marijuana card, the kinds of conditions that you have to include, have to have to qualify, and it includes trauma, it includes PTSD, it includes, um, you know, an opioid addiction. So is it harm reduction? Is it reintroducing something? It's, you know, the jury's out on a lot of this. So I just want us to all keep a really open mind about this, but again, lots to learn about. Um, you heard earlier from Trish about risk and protective factors. She did a great job. I don't need to spend a lot of time on this, but um, there you are. There they are. It's pretty obvious. What is this mom saying to her kid? What were you thinking? What were you doing? So this was what I looked like when I found out my son was using drugs a long, long time ago, and I wish I knew then what I know now. You know, first of all, wait. Why am I talking? I love this acronym. I use this in all parts of my life with my mom, with other people. Um, it really helps to, rather than react and go right for the lecture and that kind of thing, to take in a breath, let me think about this, let me talk to your dad, we're going to get on the same page, we're going to talk later. Certainly, if my child is under the influence, definitely not a good time to have this conversation. This also works for why am I texting? When you get that text, I'm going to go to so-and-so's shore house for the weekend. i got to think about this. I'm not going to answer you right now. We have a, a friend who does presentations with us. He's a clinician. He has a 12-year-old daughter, and she texted him that she wanted to go to a party at this girl's house. And he was like, mm, I don't know her, don't know her parents. The answer is no, sorry. And she texted back, oh, thank God I didn't want to go anyway. You know, so like sometimes our kids actually want that structure. They want that no sometimes, which can be a complete sentence. So we know what helicopter parents are, right? Hovering, checking things out. Do you know what a snowplow parent is? Smoothing the way, no bumps, no obstacles. When we were talking about resiliency earlier, protective factors. Oh, you found out that you, or you forgot that your paper's due tomorrow? Well, I did make you go to grandma's this weekend, so I'll help you write the paper. That's, that's a snowplow parent, right? Uh, I, I would love to see us give our kids the opportunity to learn from their oopses in life. You know, we all made them, we all learn from them. And uh, what, when do we ever grow without a challenge, without an obstacle? The snowplow parent wants to smooth away. We're robbing them of an opportunity to learn something, to be accountable, to call and ask their own question about their health insurance when they turn 27. Give them that strength and that ability to do that. I've got two kids, 27 and 30. I don't support either, either of them. They're both on their own. My son with the recovery. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Full benefits for my daughter. My son's got his, he got on the marketplace. I mean, it's like, yay, that's, that's, that's success. Neither of them has a degree yet. I don't care, because they're independent. My son is going to graduate in May uh, in, with his bachelor's at 30 years of age. I couldn't be prouder. Just had to say that. Okay, so communication skills, we talk with parents so much about this because again, that, you know, that anxious feeling that we get when we found out that our kid was doing something that we didn't want them to do. Um, so I know Trish said earlier that so many people don't want to be having to confront a parent. I do it all the time. This is what, I'm a certified family recovery specialist. Um, I work with families on a daily basis who are in this, in the, the, the mired in this stuff, and because I've been there, I'm happy to talk with them about how to find a way out, you know, lighten that path out of that scary, dark place. But know when you're ready to have these difficult conversations. You can say, I can't answer this right now. Know what kind, you know, are you asking questions of your child? Are you asking them, what's, what's this doing for you? Why do you love this so much? I remember my son, I, I would show him a website that says how bad it is for him to be smoking all this weed, and he'd show me three that showed, told me it was a great idea for him to be smoking this much weed. You know, it was a waste of energy. All I needed to say to him is, why are you so passionate about something that alters your mood? What's happening that you need to feel different than you do without it? And what can we get in your life that will help you feel better without having to turn to a substance? And being consistent. That's probably the most important thing any of us can do as parents. So 
We have a program coming up. We've got some flyers over there. It's all the way up in Montgomeryville. I hope you'll take the drive. November 15th, we have this guy, Ben Court, coming from Colorado. As I mentioned, he's a policy expert. He's also a person in recovery. He has amazing insight into this. He has no problem with an adult who is in a place where it's safe to legally use marijuana in moderation, is able to do that, just as he doesn't care if you're able to have a beer or a glass of wine when you're over 21. But it's the, again, those concentrates that I was talking about. It's the um, children. It's about young people who the outcomes for, for a child with marijuana are so different than they are for someone who's over 21 or even 25. So just a big, big shameless plug for that. No charge to attend, but we'd love to have you with us. Um, and I hope you'll visit our website. We have lots and lots of resources there as well. And you can, again, sign up to get our emails. I would like to hear from you. I'd like to know if any of you would like to share something about your experience with a young person with vaping. What have you seen? What are the challenges? Anybody want to share anything? Yes. Once they get to a, oh, once they get to a certain age, you cannot police them. You're right. Right. So, if, it is. It is prevalent. It. The, I, I will say they're not all doing it. I know, right? <laughs> it is. Yeah, we can't keep our kids in a bubble, unfortunately. It just doesn't work that way. Um, and, and the perception among young people is that everyone's doing it. I mean, they... Essential oils. Just, oh, that don't have any chemicals in them? Oh, like lavender? Go for it. <laughs> oh, she's inhaling it? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, Whole Foods has a whole section of essential oils. I love essential oils, but, but this... Right. Yeah, I don't think they're vaping that. I have no knowledge of them vaping those kinds of things necessarily. I mean, they're, they're the flavored oils that, that they're selling to go with the vape, the vape pens, um, some of those products that I showed. But, um, and, and again, they still, if it's something that's meant to be vaped, it has chemicals in it that are potentially dangerous. But to, to your point about, you know, yeah, we, we can't protect our kids from making bad decisions. But we can be incredibly clear about what the rules are in this house, what we're okay with, what we're not okay with. And if there's an indication that someone absolutely knows the rules and they're consistently breaking them and consistently pushing the envelope, I would, I would recommend an assessment. And not as a punishment, not as a, not as a way of saying, like, you know, it's enough of this, you're going to see a therapist. No, like, hey, let's... Let's look at this as an opportunity to find out why this is so important to you that you keep going back to it, you know, and, and have them seen by somebody who can talk with them because it's pretty tough with the, when we're the parent and we're angry and have a lot of fear about this stuff to have a really productive conversation and try to get at the root of something sometimes. sometimes. Um, and so I feel like getting our kids with somebody who understands adolescence, understands substance use, um, to just really help them out with what it is that they're that they're going for this feeling for, you know. Anybody else want to say anything about vaping and what you're seeing? Do you see kids doing it in front of you? Is it something that 
is pretty cavalier? Like, is the attitude about it disconcerting at all? Your kids are college age, you said, right? I didn't catch that last part. I mean, they didn't recognize that this was small. Right. 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 Yeah. Once they're, once they're over 18 and out of the house, you know, it's like, as a parent, like, welcome to my world, man. It's just, yeah, the, we do the very best we can when they're still in our care and under our roofs. And you, you know, I'll tell you, I've seen over and over again, though, when they see the consistent message, message from us, even now, even when they're older, they do come around. I mean, and it still doesn't hurt to try to educate them and give them this information. It really doesn't. Oh my God, I made my son listen to an audio tape in his car about smoking cessation, and it still took him three years to stop. You know, I wish I, I wish I could tell you there's some magic, you know, talk you could have that's going to make the difference. Consistency, you know, I love you. It's not about, it's not about, you know, my anger or whatever. It's about my love for you and that kind of stuff. It's, yeah, it's really tough when they're out of the, you know, they, we can also decide like what kind of things we're going to help them with financially. These things aren't cheap. Cigarettes aren't cheap. Vape pens aren't cheap, you know, so I'm trying to put a lid on that. Anybody else? Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Yeah, she, if you didn't hear, um, they're seeing it in the bathrooms, the kids are going in, it's easy to hide it, it's easy to conceal it, you walk in and it smells like strawberries, <laughs> you know, um, so it's very easy to conceal. You know, obviously this is just, it, it, it's, it's just a reinforcement that this is something they're working really hard to be sneaky about, the, you know, the better they get at it, the more I think there's probably a dependency. The kids who are getting caught probably aren't super dependent yet, you know, it's like they're making their mistakes, it's out in the open, like, but the kids that are, that are really getting good at it, it's so easy to disguise, um, and it, it's, it just helps us to point out to them, like, look how hard you're working to keep doing this, you know, I know that that's something that a lot of, a lot of educators are seeing, is sneaking up in the bathrooms, stairwells. Yes. Wow, well, seventh grade. <laughs> right. 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 Yes. Well, thank you for that. I don't know if you heard the comment, but her seventh, seventh grader saw this, uh, saw vaping going on and kind of called out her fellow student on it and with, with teachers. Um, so that's, that's amazing. You know, congrats to you for having a child that's willing to do that. So many kids are so afraid 
to, you know, they say I don't want to knock anybody out and all that kind of thing. I really give kids, and I, and I think it's a, that, that's a really Herculean effort for that child to do that. So I give them so much credit. Um, and, and having those conversations, I'm so glad you said that. Um, I mentioned earlier we do this program with K through five parents. What we do to prepare for that is whichever school district we're working with, we have, a, we have fifth grade teachers hand out index cards to their students and they s instruct them to not put their name on the card but write down any question they have about drugs or alcohol. Every time we do this, we're blown away. The educators are blown away and then we make copies of them and we put them on everybody's chair when they get to our event. And we're like, these are your fifth graders questions about drugs and alcohol. They're confused about the word drugs. How do I know our pharmacist isn't a drug dealer? Because aspirin's a drug, heroin's a drug, it's confusing. And they ask questions about family members who are drinking too much or maybe a little aggressive. They ask questions about heroin, fifth graders, you know. Um, how do I say no when somebody, you know, when somebody I really like asks me to try something, you know. So we present that to parents as conversation starters. You know, pick some of these that you want to discuss and say, this is one of your classmates' questions. Have you ever thought about this? And again, instead of going to the lecture, ask, ask them some questions. Well, what do you think about that? What do you think is, do you think that's safe? You know, and ask them to, you know, kind of express their feelings about it and then make your feelings and, and your values as a family member really clear. It's always just so powerful to, I think, did anybody see the Mr. Rogers movie, the documentary? I love that movie. I love Mr. I grew up from Pittsburgh, so I, I, I'm a longtime fan. Um, but what I loved in that movie was watching him interact with children at his live events. And he would be with a little kid, and he'd get all scrunched down little with them, and he would ask them a question. And when they answered it, he didn't respond. He just kind of went like this, and they kept talking. Like, that's such a cool thing, just to let our kids talk about this stuff. And when I showed that, that those communication skills, like, when we hear something that we might not like to hear, like my, you know, my, let's say my little boy came home and said, you know, Jimmy, let me try a cigarette. Am I going to freak out? Am I going to be like, well, you can't be spending any more time with Jimmy. Or am I going to say, um, you know, wow, I'm so glad you told me. I'm really glad you told me, like what your daughter did, you know, and... We're going to think it. Daddy and I are going to think about this. We're going to talk about it some more, and we'll talk after dinner tonight. Um, because we obviously need to make it clear that we don't want you to do this, but we're so glad you told us. Because we want our child to come back to us. We want to give them an honest response about this. Without the fear, without judgment, without like, oh, forget it, that kid's bad news. Because he just did the same thing that the friend did, you know? So what does that say about him? Um, we really want to empower our kids to know that um, they can tell us anything, but also that they can um, uh, tell us about a friend that they're worried about and we're not going to make a judgment about that person. How are we doing? On time? Oh, okay. Anybody else? Okay, I'm early. Are you okay with that? Okay, all right, great. Well, thank you, everyone. Appreciate your time. Um, I'm Josie, and I'm in Garden Valley, Toledo. Hi, I'm Deanna, and I'm also in Garden Valley, Toledo. I'm Nick, and I'm in Garden Valley, Toledo as well. I am Aiden, and I'm uh, in Garden Valley, Toledo also. I'm Abby, and I'm, and I'm the last one in Garden Valley, Toledo. Hi, I'm Rachel, and I'm part of Walking Club of Garden Valley. Hi, I'm Kelly, and I'm also part of Walking Club. Hi, I'm Kelly Ace, I'm Program Director at the Family Support Line, which focuses on child sexual abuse prevention and treatment. Okay, so everybody has uh, index cards on their table. We'd like to ask you to leave any questions you might have for this panel and write them down.
So, uh, I believe Avidum is a club about talking about and acknowledging different issues in mental health and finding ways to incorporate activities and awareness throughout the entire school. Uh, we do different events. We do uh, semicolon dice, so we will um, sell little semicolon tattoos. Um, semicolon day is for suicide awareness. The semicolon represents, instead of ending a sentence with a period, continuing it with the semicolon. We also strive to create an environment and a community that is accepted, cared for, acknowledged, and like loved as like a community in general, and we're always really there for each other. And we just bring awareness to the school about different issues, whether it's mental health awareness or not that could be going on with people and ways to help them through it. I think we also try to make sure that um, every kid knows at school that if they're dealing with uh, like depression or anxiety or anything like that, that there's people who are out there that can help them and that they aren't alone dealing with it. Other people go through the same thing as well and there's always a way to get through it with somebody else that's like, trained to help people through it. basically where we work with our own peers in the resource room that have many different needs and we work with them with social skills and also with physical activity because a lot of them need help with this and this helps them before they leave the school to become familiar with different things in life so that really helps them. And we do a lot of fun activities. We walk every Tuesday after school around the school and last Tuesday we did a scavenger hunt so the kids really enjoyed that. And then we also do like other fun events like going to Windmill, going bowling, going to Sky Zone, and going out to dinner. Sorry, I didn't realize I was late. Uh, but uh, I'm Matt Evans. I work for the Criminal Investigation Division for Delaware County. Uh, where I'm assigned to the Pennsylvania Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. Um, part of my responsibilities, um, I do all the internet safety presentations at uh, the schools for parents and students. Not only do they have rules with safety, especially physically, with weapons and such, but like they enforce them if someone is caught with them or in trouble with them. It helps to know that instead of it just being let go and like, oh, don't do it again, they actually do get like a punishment for it. It makes us feel safer that they're actually going to take action and care about our safety enough to bring it to that student's attention. We also have um, a good amount of like security guards walking around the school, just making sure that everything is safe. Um, and we have a back entrance to the school through the cafeteria, and at, when the first bell rings, those doors are locked, so that anybody, nobody can go out those doors and come back in. They need to go around to the front office and make sure that they are checked in, and, pro and the office knows that they're safe enough to walk through the school. And I think it just gives the students like an extra sense of, okay, the school's making sure that anybody who comes in that isn't a student is a safe person and that they won't cause harm to any other students in the school. So I think uh, quite a bit has been invested in helping our students feel safe in their schools. And if you look at Bays, the majority of students in Delaware County do feel safe, which is a wonderful thing. But there's other kinds of safety as well, safety emotionally. Um, cultural sensitivity, trauma-informed. And like all of the schools, we are working very hard to make sure that all kids feel safe in every area that we can now identify. And I'm sure there are areas we will identify in the future as well. We also We have 
have we run trainings periodically, and Francesca Pelleggi is probably our main contact person with the BUDEM in the state. Um, you can contact her or contact me. I think my contact information is there and I can relate it. And I know we'd love to do another training here in Delaware County, which involves our students here. Um, that was the thing that so impressed us when we were up in Jim Thorpe, was just the positivity for a suicide prevention committee or club that um, was such a wonderful thing. So we'd, we'd love to have one. Uh, I think the biggest risk right now, the biggest issue right now, isn't so much that drugs are a thing, because drugs are always going to be a thing, but it's so easy to get them now. That's the issue now, is it's so easy to obtain them, to buy them, to get them, and to use them. That's the issue now, like, because we're never going to be able to get rid of drugs. It's not possible to get rid of every drug on the face of the earth. It's just not going to happen. But the issue now is just you can literally go online and within 10 minutes buy drugs and have it on your way to your house with express shipping in three days. Like, it's so easy to obtain them and that's what we need to get under control. Hi, this is kind of my specialty in cyber safety report. Um, as far as the conversation starts, okay, like I said, I do uh, internet safety presentations uh, for any school, any organization that requests them. I just did a parent presentation in this county about three weeks ago, and I had one parent show up. Okay, that's the biggest issue. Okay, I've been to schools before that had 6,000 students, and I've had maybe 10 people show up. Okay, um, as far as parents go, I'm a parent myself. And the one thing, kids get victimized on the internet every day. Okay, a lot of times you get kids that go online, they meet somebody, they think um, that that person's interested in them uh, for whatever reason, next thing you know, they start exchanging pictures. And then that student or that child ends up getting blackmailed. Okay, if you're a parent, You've got to be able to be able to have a conversation with your child to where you're not yelling at them, to where you're not saying, "Oh, this is your fault," okay? Because they are actually being victimized, okay? And especially with cyberbullying, okay? As adults, okay, when we when we were kids, you know, what did a cell phone look like? Okay, what did a big giant piece of plastic? Okay, we didn't have text messages, no Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, none of that stuff. So for us, when we think about bullying, we think about what goes on in school. We don't think about it because we never experienced cyberbullying. And as adults, we don't realize that cyberbullying goes on 24 hours a day. Okay, and to the last question about some of the, the issues, uh, uh, safety issues with kids, a lot of them, I would say social media, okay, Cell phones, a lot of parents give their kids cell phones and they think it's the ultimate babysitter. Kids come home from school, they go up to their room, they don't see them again until dinner time. And what they don't realize is that kids are online going, I mean, basically the internet is an open door to your house. All right, and so many times we've had kids that have gotten in trouble for sexting, cyberbullying, and there are two statutes right now in Pennsylvania dealing specifically with juveniles that either sex or cyberbullying. Okay, in Delaware County, if a juvenile does get caught, they go through a diversionary program, okay, nothing goes on their record. They may or may not get their device back, okay, um, but nothing will go on their record. If they get caught again, then they do stand a chance of going through the juvenile court system. All right, we get adults that call our office, okay, that took pictures explicit pictures when they were kids, when they were in high school, and now that they're adults, those pictures are now resurfacing. All right, and that's, a lot of kids don't understand, okay, they think they can take pictures, delete them, and they're gone, but what they don't realize is someone could have seen it, saved it, and they can do whatever they want with them. 
our time in here too, we uh, at Family Support Line also provide abuse prevention programs, including cyber safety programs for uh, youth as well as adults. And I certainly can agree the challenge of getting parents out, and usually when you have parents out, they're the ones who are already pretty well informed. Uh, I think we need to really change our whole messaging approach to parents. So the three minute video that we send out through an email push will probably be more effective than setting up 900 different meetings because folks are not going to be able to come out. Um, I think we as adults really need to get past how things were different when we were young and look at what's really going on now. If we look at the number of adults who've lost their jobs, their positions, and we start talking about how kids today are, I think we are turning off every kid who hears us. And so we need to talk about what is the reality. Please educate me. I don't know about this. Let's talk about this. And it's not a one-time conversation. It's a conversation that's ongoing. How do you problem solve when somebody is saying obnoxious things to you? How do you help a friend? These are ongoing conversations that schools also need to have for their faculty and their staff and their administrators where you're actually dealing with the real problems, not just talking in the generalities. Because this stuff is hard. It's hard for me as an adult who's fairly good at problem solving. It's much harder when you're a youth who may not have the resources and may not have a parent they really can talk to. Thank you. And I, I couldn't agree more. I think schools have always been the place where kids can be educated and stand hand in hand with parents. And this is an issue that is extremely on all of our minds and creates situations that kids cannot easily get out of once they're, once they're in there. One thing that we've done in the Garden Valley Middle School as mentioned before, um, all of our phys ed classes for one day, and this will be repeated throughout the year, worked on different grade levels in terms of cyber safety. Because um, kids feel, and their friends are so personal to them, that this is something where they will be safe. So explaining that we have locks on our schools and no one can come in, that's why you feel safe here. Your parents have locks in their houses so no one can get into your house. The internet has no locks. You are responsible for your security and your parents are responsible for that security so that invaders or, or those who would do you harm cannot get access to you. So we'll continue those discussions with kids. And part of that was for homework, was you needed to take home these main points, teach them to your parents, and have your parents sign off that they had done this with you. Because it's very much a family issue, and we want to keep them all safe. Um, well, I believe this question has a lot of possible answers to it, um, but uh, I've personally dealt with someone that I've known who uh, was hurting himself. So my first idea was go to their parent because I was really close with their family. So I said, okay, I'm going to call their parent. So I did, and I said, look, I think this is the right thing to do. They can hate me for the rest of their life, but if they get the help they want, then it's the best thing that they can do. And so you could go to a trusted parent or a guidance counselor, somebody who can have easy access to the student, but not share the information with anybody else. Because if a friend tells you about something that's going on, they trust you enough to not tell anybody else. So you want to make sure that you can go to one person that you can get help for them that they won't tell anybody else. Uh, like Nick had said, it can be really hard to break that promise sometimes to have to tell somebody, especially if they have promised, or that you have promised, I won't tell anyone if you stop. That's what a lot of kids get stuck in. I won't say anyone if you help yourself and if you stop. But a lot of times that just doesn't work. They have gotten so far, they've lost the strength. They can't come back without help. And that's part of the problem. And so it can be really hard to break that promise and to have to tell somebody. But in some cases, it's would you rather lose a friendship or a friend? Like, that's the main point. That's what you need to think of. And it can be really, really hard. And you, they might not be your friend anymore. But at least you know that they're safe and that they've gotten help.
All right, I just want to throw this out sort of as a resource along, along those lines. Um, most of my work uh, comes from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. All right, they are congressionally mandated to accept reports from the general public and from industry, namely um, internet service providers, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, all that, because they're under federal law to report any type of child exploitation on their networks. Um, and in particular, and I'll never forget this one, uh, it was probably 11 o'clock at night, and I got a phone call from the National Center saying, uh, we just got a report from a 14-year-old girl who said she was at school and her best friend told her that she met somebody on the internet, she was being blackmailed, okay, because she sent pictures to this person. And now she's being blackmailed and she said she was going to kill herself. So we literally did not have much information to go on. We had a general area where we were actually able to track down who this child's parents were. And we were, I was on the phone at 1130 calling the state police barracks. And we were able to actually send a state trooper to that house to do uh, a, a check on her. And come to find out that the child's parents did not know anything about what was going on with her online. Okay. Um, and that's just one of the things, because sometimes kids don't want to tell their parents because they're afraid they're going to get in trouble. So they tell a friend, okay? And this goes for all you guys who look. If you ever find out, you can always call the National Center, okay? 1 800 The Loss. You can make a report online. Uh, the website is cybertipline.com. Or the other thing you can do is you can always call your own police department as well. Congratulate your child knows how to use email because email is so out of it anymore for most kids. So there, there is that. Um, I, I think you know when we talk about inappropriate, I think we need to talk about a lot of different things to define what we're really talking about first. Um, you know, certainly there is a huge concern not only legally but in terms of mental health and socially for anybody who's sending any kind of sexually explicit material, whether it's of themselves or someone else. But I think there's a lot of other things. We're talking about harassment. We're talking about people who are being, um, you know, bullied because of their sexual orientation, because of their gender identity, because of their race, because of their culture. So there's a lot of things that can come under that category. So knowing who the resources are for different kinds of problems, I think, is very important. Certainly with NECNEC, the National Center, um, that's a, a wonderful resource, as is our local ICAC. Um, but I think also talking with schools, schools oftentimes are the ones who have everything dumped on them because you guys can't control everything. So, you know, looking at what is the nature of the inappropriateness, let's look at safety. Is there an imminent risk, as in the case of suicide, or are we talking about something more long-term and social or emotional that we need to get mental health resources in there? So, the other thing I would just say to parents is stop, don't breathe, and don't yell. Think it through and get some guidance, whether it's from a professional or a more cool thinking member of your family, because how you handle things when this first happens sets the course for whether you can have a really successful uh, intervention or whether things get worse. Everything she just said. Um, I mean, naturally, I'm going to say, call your local law enforcement. Um, whether or not it's a crime, okay, that's something that you know we would determine. Um, but the first thing you got to do is you got to have a conversation with your child and say, okay, what's going on, okay? And you got to reassure them that they're not going to get in trouble, okay? Because um, we do get kids that are afraid to say anything because you know I go to schools and I tell them about the law and I tell them about sex and that they can get in trouble. And so a lot of times kids won't say anything when they're getting when. It started as sexting, but now it's blackmail. Okay, and then it turns into bullying. Okay, that's completely different. They're now victims. Okay, and they're going to be treated as such. Um, but I mean, from my point of view, the biggest thing is, you know, if you think your child's in imminent danger, don't hesitate. Pick up the phone, call 911, get law enforcement involved. Okay, um, but you guys have any? I agree with you, um, and I want to look at like the other side of it. If it's not something inappropriate, 
but let's say you're talking to a friend and they have to change their email because something happened with their old one and your parent isn't used to it. I think one of the most important things is for a parent to like stay calm and just can like ask the child about it and not argue with them, but also have all the information they can get and not just jump into it assuming that they're talking to some stranger on the internet and hiding it from their parents because let's say that it is their friend and they just they didn't tell their, they informed their parents saying, hey, look, they got a new email, here's what it is, nothing bad's happening. The kid could just start um, like, you know, denying it and be like, look, this isn't what you think it is. And the parent can be like, I just don't believe you, so this is what's happening. And there's not, like, half the, half the important information there is completely missing. So overall, the most important thing is like to stay calm about it, have all the information, and just talk about it calmly. Just one other thing on that, and it's because I've seen this before. As, as a parent, you're, you're always going to want to defend your child, okay? We've seen parents before that have found out that their child, somebody said something bad about them on Instagram, okay? Because you guys aren't using Facebook anymore, are you? Oh, yeah. Oh, you're still using Facebook? Really? Uh, no, you're not. Yeah, I see. No, 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 no. Okay, most kids are all like, oh, no, we don't use Facebook. They still have Facebook, but they don't use it. Okay, so we get parents that will actually go online and try to bully the child that's bullying their child. Please don't do that, all right? Because you're going to wind up getting in trouble yourself, all right? The best thing to do, whatever it is, try and save it. You know, if it's email, or not email, but text messages, Photoshop, whatever it is, just try and save it and, and make it available to law enforcement. But like you said, don't... Don't yell at them, okay, don't, don't try to be the investigator, just comfort them, try to figure out what happened to make sure that they're safe. disabled person themselves to have someone to talk to, to have friends, and to be able to learn how to socialize and things like that. But it gives you life lessons too. You can learn how to be patient. You learn how to deal with unexpected situations when something unexpected goes wrong. Um, as things will in life, you need to be able to know how to calmly handle the situation. And sometimes being with someone with a disability or with challenges that can make it hard to be with them can help a lot with that. So for me, I really feel like it just makes me happy being able to spend time with these other kids in my own school that are my peers that I don't always see during the school day, so being able to spend other time with them really makes me happy. And also just gaining more friends like right outside, the, not in your grade and everything, with other grades, and like different people is important. Uh, I feel like everyone having somebody else is important because like if you graduate from college and you don't know what you're going to do it's good to have a base of people around you because they can help you out they can help you decide what you want to do like you could major in something specific and not know where to go for a job but let's say like abby has a connection she could like let me know and you're not just on your own wandering trying to figure out where to take your life it's important. It's just important to have good people, good people around you. I'm just going to add because Hayes is all about data, but the data on students with disabilities is that in secondary schools they become extremely isolated. They don't go to the dances. They don't go to the games. They don't realize that they could have friends there. And I know at Garnet Valley it's been a long-standing um, part of us that that kids interact with kids with disabilities all the time, but even there, in that secondary piece in the high school, that falls away. So Walking Club is one of those places where we go to the thon together, we do a bunch of things together, and as one of our students um, said, it has challenges, we're just friends together. So that's, that's been, I think, very helpful for everyone, 
and typical ed kids who maybe have been bullied significantly have always benefited as well from those folks who are just, it's just like being relaxed when you're with them. They're not judging, they are very um, open and positive, so I think it's been a wonderful thing for all the kids to be involved. And I know in the plays, we also have that in our um, drama club, and that's been a, a great thing as well. not something that kids deal with specifically in that time. It's something that students deal with all year long. Because, I mean, if people deal with it uh, in a, for a specific month, then, I mean, it's still it's a big problem because there'd be more people there. But if you raise awareness for it all year long, and people, kids know that, like, there's always somebody there who can help them. They're not going to be stuck there just dealing with it themselves, thinking about oh, I need to wait till this specific time to get help for it, so. Um, 
I think there should be like a club made by students for students. Because in some cases, some students don't like talking to like parents or teachers or uh, guidance counselors. But if like if there's like a student that one person can talk to, I think it might be helpful. And if that, that one student can properly help that student not like do any harm. I think that they could just enforce the rules established by the school. They can, like, um, specifically, like, they could do different drills. They could do, like, lockdown drills and fire drills often so that kids know that if something like this actually does happen, there's a set procedure that can happen so that everybody can get out. Okay. Um, and if they can... They just ensure that students are always safe in school. Always have people walking around to monitor the outside of the school and the inside so that let's just say that there's some suspicious person walking on the school. They know that somebody will see it and do something about it and they're just not gonna be there the entire day. Um, also, aside from just being safe physically, being safe like mentally and feeling mentally safe, is also really important. I think it's important to inform the teachers that sometimes students need a break, especially if we're in a schedule like Garden Valley is we have block schedules. So each period is 80 minutes long. That's a really long time to be in one classroom. Um, and sometimes you can't go that long, especially if you have a really bad day just sitting there in your own thoughts for 80 minutes. Sometimes students can, I mean, teachers can be a little hostile if you ask to go for a walk or ask to go to the bathroom. And I think it's important to let teachers know that sometimes we need that break and that it's important to give us five minutes to recharge if that is just a five minute walk up and down the hallway and coming back. That we're not all trying to skip class because we don't like you. We're just trying to recharge a little bit. I agree with Abby that teachers should allow a few minutes in, uh, during the class to have students get up and maybe go get a drink or we'll just walk around for a little bit. And I think like the best time to implement that in a school is between subject changes. So let's say you're in English and you're working on grammar and writing for 45 minutes, and then you wanna jump right into reading. Take about, you can take like two, three minutes of a break in between there and just have students be able to get up and stretch and walk around and just be ready for the next lesson instead of sitting for the entire 80 minutes straight. <coughs> I have just one last thing. At our school, we have tons of different guidance counselors. We don't have just one. We are split up throughout the alphabet, but say my guidance counselor is in a meeting. You can talk to any guidance counselor that's there. And I think that's really awesome that we have so many. And I think it would be cool if other schools had several different guidance counselors. I think we have like six, and that's a lot. And sometimes they're in meetings, and sometimes they're just meeting with a kid already about college or something, and they can't talk to you. So we always have an option to talk to someone. Someone is always available. And then we also always have a school psychiatrist in the school who can always come down at any time, especially if it's urgent, and is always open to talking to you and freeing up their schedule if they need to, to take care of the issue that you're dealing with. about taking a break, would you feel comfortable addressing the faculty? Yeah. And seeing how, you know, you could make that happen? Okay, sounds good. Back down. I think we also need to recognize that many kids are walking through hallways in schools in every single school in this county where they are walking past the people who sexually or physically assaulted them and maybe never told anyone. They are walking past kids who have teased them and laughed after some sexual photo went viral, and it's day in, day out, it goes on and on and on. Sometimes, you know, there has been a report, but maybe it hasn't been one where systems could really respond as much as we would like. That doesn't change what the child's reality is every day. And so I think we need to be really creative and work together across systems and across disciplines to try and problem solve those situations. Um, you know, the kids who are harassed day in, day out because of their gender identity or their sexual orientation, 
it goes on and on, and sometimes it's easier because everybody's busy to kind of look the other way. We can't keep doing this. I think dealing with a trauma-informed space and having teachers and the others have the resources they need because when you've got giant classrooms and lots of kids everywhere and you are trying to keep the order, it's really not possible to do that kind of child-centered uh, approach that we, we like to talk about. So again, let's really look at how we can problem solve and encourage kids to come forward and talk about what's going on anonymously if need be because people don't want to be labeled snitches and that stops a lot of kids from ever letting any adult know what's really going on. It is a very good thing. Um, like, along with um, Abby saying before that teachers could be hesitant to let students out of the class, um, it's another factor that students could be going to the bathroom just to go vape with their friends because they don't want to be in class. They want to be doing something that they would actually enjoy. And, I mean, a lot of kids get caught but I don't think that's gonna stop them from doing it. Like, if they get caught in school, it's, they're gonna think of it as a slap on the wrist. And they're gonna go home and do it again. Because that's what they think is like the most important thing to do. So, I feel like there could be a little bit more enforcement of it. And, like Adam was saying, teachers are hesitant to let students have breaks, have mental breaks, and go to the bathrooms because of that reason. For me, I have had a lot of friends that have been telling me that there's a lot of vaping. Like, during like lunches, uh, like, there'll be like a group of 10 or more in the boys' or girls' bathroom just sleeping because they think it's fun and they think it helps with like anxiety because it calms them down. So, yeah. And people can, like, let's say there's 10 people in the bathroom, they could all be sharing one. And I mean, that's not sanitary either, so that's, that's not the best thing you can um, not only do kids go to the bathroom and vape, the jewel device that they use to vape is highly concealable and they can use it to vape in class. They, I don't know how they do it because they're obviously really good at it because they don't get caught. But like, I, they just conceal it so well and some teachers are so oblivious and they don't understand like, they'll be like, yeah, what's that smell? And be like, oh yeah, it's really fruity. I don't know, it smells good. So like, I don't know, like I don't know how they do it, but it is very big in the school. And yeah. Yeah, we've even been in classes where we like look over and someone is vaping. But the thing is, you keep it in your mouth long enough, and you finally let out that breath, and there's no smoke because it's evaporated. There's no, you don't see any of that fog that you would normally see, and that's what's helping kids get away with it so easy. Like. You put it in your sleeve and just act, act like you're itching your nose and people are taking puffs of their vape pens and that no one ever notices because when you hold it in your mouth long enough, it, it just gets rid of all the visual effects that you've had from it. So this is no surprise to anyone who works in the school. They are everywhere and certainly we're educating parents. We don't always have a lot show up to our new programs. We're looking at additional consequences, but in the interim, kids are getting addicted to nicotine. It's a highly addictive substance. They cannot stop. Um, some are even just sucking the fluid out of those um, the little uh, cartridges. So again, I think it's one of those things where it's hit us like a ton of bricks, and we have to work together to find some solutions and to help these kids. They have made themselves human experiments. We have no idea what this stuff is doing to their lungs, to their brains, um, to their futures. Uh, speaking of vaping in class, uh, last year I saw a kid vape, like he was watching the teacher, make sure was, her back is turned. He thought, oh, okay, guys, watch this. He just vapes in class. I'm like, well, I, I'm like surprised when we caught it because of the smell. Did you go ahead? Um, my friends that I know do vape, 
they have offered me, like I don't, and I wouldn't ever, I don't think, but they've offered me it and I've said no and they've taken it. Like I've never been peer pressured into it because they're expensive and people realize that and they don't want to waste their money on something that someone else doesn't want to do. So it's peer pressure isn't really a thing that's as prevalent anymore. It's just like curiosity is what's really getting people into it. Or like their friends are doing it and they think it's cool too and there's tricks and all of that that they can do with like the smoke which is not very common, I don't know. Along with this, yeah. Along with what Ms. Falcone was saying is that I think people who vape think it's less harmful than cigarettes for them. I mean, that might be true, but it's still giving, putting nicotine in the body and it's making it an addictive thing. And not only is it harming their body, but it's like affecting them in school. They can get in trouble for it. They can be suspended, which stops them from getting the classwork and learning what they need to do. And I was going to say something else, but I don't remember. Aha, I do remember. Um, I've heard a few people talk, like just, like Josie was saying, it's the pods that kids buy, they're expensive. And I've heard people talk about how they take money from their parents or their friends just to buy them. So not only are they doing, um, like they're not, not only are they vaping in school and like affecting themselves there, but they're also stealing from their parents, which is like not okay. Um, another thing with being caught and getting in trouble, stuff like that, oh, we need to inform kids that it's not worth it. It's not worth to get caught with drugs and have it on your record forever. What college is going to accept a kid knowing they've done drugs, knowing they might be a risk factor to turn their school's reputation into we do drugs here? Like, we need to inform kids that it's just not worth the risk. It's not worth ruining your future. It's not worth ruining your chances to have an awesome career and live the amazing life that you deserve. So, two things. One, it's not just vape that's also the problem. I hear sometimes it's uh, weed and marijuana, but it's like not as much as vape. And also, yeah, it's like less chemicals and uh, cigarettes, but still vaping, but even though we still haven't done a long-term science study yet. It could cause cancer, just like cigarettes. Um, earlier in the one of the the vaping presentation, it was said that the pods, um, one of them equals a whole pack of cigarettes, and it, I'm pretty sure they said that it would last a person maybe a week. But I know people who have gone through them in a day, like. They go through one whole pod in one day, which is equal to one to two packs of cigarettes, which I think is like insane. Um, kids don't only uh, vape in school either. There are dab pens which contain THC, and they'll use that in school, and most kids will use it because it makes their day go by faster. That's what they use it for but in reality, it's hurting them in the long run because they're not able to pay attention in school. And they're going to complain that their grades are going to drop, which will lead to them using it more often to get that subject off their mind, to cope with the feeling or cope that they are failing the subject, that they might not pass this grade. And it's just turning worse and worse because kids will wake up and use a dab pen and they'll get to school and use it again. And, yeah. Um, also, because the vapes or jewels or whatever, they um, contain nicotine, the people who do vape, or vape, the people who do vape um, get buzzed off of them. And it's not why, it's not really the vaping that they're addicted to, it's the feeling of being buzzed, um, or like high, I guess. And, the nicotine, I guess, but. What are some of the biggest issues in this cat on the web targeting kids? Uh, targeting cats? Uh, I would think. <laughs> I feel like social media is a big factor for targeting kids. Because it can be used for a lot of fun things, like 
But say you go to a concert and your friends weren't there, you can share pictures and videos of a fun concert with everybody. But it's also used for bad. Like um, Snapchat, it's you send a picture, it's gone. Like you think it's gone, but people can screenshot it. I mean, yeah, there's a notification that they screenshot it, but still, they can take it. They can take it. So there's a lot of like bad outcomes of that. Um, social media also promotes vaping and stuff like that. Um, it will make it colorful and pop out because that's what advertisements are supposed to do. They're supposed to grab your attention so they can attract younger viewers with the colorful um, pictures or the um, uh, things that would attract younger viewers as in like us as in teenagers. They will say, oh yeah, there's this cool new vape that has a flavor of fruit punch. And they'll be like, oh yeah, let me try it. And then that will lead to uh, them vaping and addiction and stuff like that. Aside from just like drugs and stuff like that, there's also always the body image issue that social media gives us that we think everyone on social media who is famous lives this amazing life because that's what they choose to put on there. Like, they still have their bad days, they still are not perfect people, but they show the world that they are. That's all they put out there so that they seem like they are. And it hurts a lot of people and it leads to a lot of self-consciousness when people see, they'll scroll by and see a Victoria Justice advertisement and it's this beautiful thin body and we are getting better with using different sizes and different races in advertising but if you're looking at a plus size model and a thin model you're s everyone is still going to pick the thin model we're still advertising people of bigger sizes and different races but the, the actual issue itself isn't going away we're saying that it is because they're there but the issue of the thin people are getting attention hasn't gone away. And that's the issue, is because that's what we're seeing on the internet. Okay, which app do you want to talk about first? Actually, you go to my internet safety presentation, Snapchat is always my number one, or it used to be. Do um, uh, you guys use any apps to hide stuff? Come on, you can admit it. All right, well, part of my presentation is I, for parents, of course, not, not for the kids, um, is I go through a list of the apps that kids download to their phones to where they can hide stuff. They can hide their pictures, their text messages, videos, other apps, that sort of thing. And it seems like every month there's a new list coming out. Um, one of the big things I tell parents is just go on Google and type in, all right, plug your ears, don't listen to this the top apps for hiding stuff, okay? Um, as far as Snapchat, um, Snapchat does report to the National Center for the Sound and Children because they are based out of the United States and we do get, we got, today I wanna to say we got 10 reports from Snapchat involving juveniles exchanging explicit images of themselves. Um, Kids think that they can take a picture, send it, it's the person only gets 10 seconds to do it, and then it gets deleted. What they don't realize is most kids today have more than one device that has a camera on it. So they can take a screen capture and the notification does not go through. If the person were to screen capture it using the, um, the original device. Um, the other issue is there have been uh, glitches in certain operating systems to where the notifications were not going through. Um, Facebook now has uh, a portion of their Messenger app which allows people to send secret messages um, to where Facebook has even said we cannot see what the message is uh, because it's encrypted from device to device. Uh, some ways around that for parents if they share the same cloud Okay, or the same iTunes account, if the child goes to download an app, guess what? It shows up on mom and dad's device as well. Alright, um, the big thing I tell parents as far as the apps with kids, they need to check the phones randomly. Okay, do not say, okay, Sunday night at 8 o'clock, guess what? I'm checking your phones. Because what are they going to do at 7.30 at night? They're going to be deleting everything. 
There's also a way, there's also a way you can hide stuff within the operating system on the device. So I tell parents when you go to check it, shut the phone off and then restart it. Anything that was hidden in the operating system will reappear. Plus it gives the parent a chance to check the password for the device. Um, do you guys have any apps in particular you guys have issues with? I know Instagram is starting to, um, we're having issues with Instagram. You know who owns Instagram? Facebook. Because I go tell kids this and I'm like, what? No, Facebook doesn't own that. We don't like Facebook anymore. I'm like, no, no, they own it. Um, I'm trying to think what other apps. Uh, WhatsApp, we have it. WhatsApp actually is starting to report to us now. Facebook, Instagram, uh, Omegle, you guys on Omegle still? No? What about Meet Me? Meet you guys don't know, it's so crazy. On the east coast of Pennsylvania, nobody hears about Meet Me, but they're actually a cup kit. You guys still on Kick? No, I don't know why. Um, Kick was huge with kids, uh, used to be. Um, Meet Me is, uh, was, is a social media site, it's now an app, that uh, was created by two high school students in Pennsylvania. Um, it, for whatever reason, it's not big on the east coast of Pennsylvania, but in the middle of the state, it is huge. We get tons of reports from me. Yeah, it's two high school students that created it. And Omegle lost its reputation. Omegle, Omegle lost their reputation? Yeah, because it's turned into inappropriate stuff. Yeah, it's yeah, creepers. Yep. Yeah, most of the time it's, it's a, adults pretending to be kids on there and they get kids to do things. Um, any other apps you guys have? Yeah. Oh, 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 you want the mic back? <laughs> oh, it's mine. There you go. Okay, I'm gonna back this way. Uh, another thing that with Instagram is kids will make a Finsta, which is their uh, separate Instagram account where they can post embarrassing pictures and like talk about what they've done crazy because Let's say that someone has their regular Instagram where they can post pictures of concerts or fun events they did at school with their friends. And then they can go to the other account and post videos and pictures of them at parties getting drunk or getting high with their friends. But I've heard people say that like even though that's their separate account, you can follow, you can follow yourself and it's linked to you. So let's say college goes to look at your social media, they'll find it, they'll see those pictures and videos that you've done. So even though you think it's hidden, it's really not. We have even had issues in Grand Valley with someone, we still don't know who, made a fake Instagram account and had spread rumors about people, like posted like rumors and just untrue things. And the school ends up seeing it, obviously, and kids in the school end up saying, oh, so-and-so does this or that, or so-and-so likes this or that. And it's not only untrue, but we still don't know who this person was. And the person who it's about can end up getting in trouble for that. And it was never true to begin with. So we're having trouble with like rumors being spread on social media and lies being posted about people. I guarantee you that if you gave me a little time, I could use any app or any website to somehow do mischief or worse to somebody. I think, you know, we're looking at several issues here. One, I mean, there's certainly sending or receiving sexually explicit materials, whether they are illegal ones or not. Um, there's also, you know, the opportunities for people to share information that it would not be prudent for them to share. So the online journals and diaries, have a separate risk, uh, you know, in a different way. I think, you know, whether we're looking at kids who are playing games on Xbox and there's a, this constant stream of harassment and, and, you know, just talk of threats and, and, you know, a lot of things that um, over time eat away at people. It's a whole different kind of issue. So I think we can, you know, think about sort of in general, here are some of the most common ways that we look at this, but then going to the individual child or the individual family, we need the conversations ongoing with them about what means the most to them and what's, uh, you know, we find with a lot of certainly online predators, it's paying attention to them. So if you want to go on IMVU, 
and try out nine different pairs of outfits so that somebody can say, hey, you've got great taste. There's nothing about that particular platform that matters. It's about it's a way to make a connection that can be exploited. So again, I think we need to, to kind of keep an eye on some of the realities of, say, Snap or uh, Instagram or, or, or the specifics. But also just understand the bigger dynamics here, because there isn't a person in this room who doesn't like attention sometimes. And so we all could be potentially vulnerable, but when you mix that with folks who have less experience, and we are also coming up at a time, culturally, that's different than any of we've ever had. We have more content that's sexual in nature that's available to preschoolers than we've ever certainly had. And so we don't fully even understand what's going on here. That's why the conversation must be going on all the time. Instagram. There's also been a YouTube video that was like a threat. I don't know what year it was. It was last year. And there was some kid, I don't know if they caught him or not, but it was like just like really edited video. Well, I think whenever, what's, what's good in schools is that we are alert to any threats and monitoring as many different platforms as we can and intervening and calling in law enforcement. And law enforcement has been wonderful to schools to help us trace and look and, and find any threats to schools. I haven't personally experienced it, but I know, I know kids have been peer pressured into vaping, like Josie said. But a lot of kids, if you say no when it comes to vaping, they'll just let it go because it's an expensive thing. So they're not going to want to waste it on somebody who doesn't want to do it. They're just going to be like, okay, more for me. And just letting them know. I think a lot of times for kids it's providing a place and an opportunity and an adult to sponsor um, things that I think come naturally to them. So I think you can absolutely start it up if you are a counselor or teacher or whomever, start a club and contact the teachers of any students in your school who have disabilities. And I always get parent permission um, so that everyone who is involved has that permission to participate, um, especially if we're going off site. The other piece that we do with walking club, parents do the transportation, so it's after school. And there is usually a cost involved, because as kids get older, there will be costs to accessing any kind of recreation. So I think that's another piece. And they get to see places that maybe they wouldn't typically go. So I think it's something you can definitely do. Um, it doesn't just have to be high school as well, because I know we have an Avita at our middle school that was starting. So, I think we're going to try and branch out to more than just the high school. Because if we can get the middle school involved, we can get all the kids there, know what it is, and have them come to high school and join our group as well. Did you want to say you guys went to walking club? How you got involved in walking club? Um, we got involved our freshman year, and we had it at the club fair. And we read like the biography about it and thought it was really interesting, so we thought we'd join. And just making sure all the students in the school really know about what's available to them. So a lot of times schools will have this, but the students don't know how to get involved or who they should talk to about it. I think that student, I think that uh, parents should just like sit down with their kids and say, 
this is what I found out about this. Can you tell me honestly if you are, if you're doing it or if you have? Like, don't tell them that you're gonna be in serious trouble if you if they've done it because it's in the past, or if they are doing it. Let them know that they that you want them to stop, and that these are this is what can happen if you keep doing it. Like Aiden was saying, kids can do it, and their grades will drop. And if the grades drop, they might not get into a good college. Without a good college education, they might not have the best career. So I think parents should just sit down with their kids and talk about it. It's the best way that they can get the point to their kids. Like I had said earlier, reminding them of their future is a big one. You can't do anything about it if they've done it in the past. It, like you have said, it's, it's the past. If they're struggling with it now, you can help, however, to change it and to steer their future back into the right direction. And I feel like Putting a kid's future on the line is a big thing because we all want to be successful and be able to live on our own independently and have a good life. And when they realize that doing something as simple as vaping can really affect that in a very, very negative way, they'll think twice when someone asks them, hey, come vape with me. I'm sorry, I'm sort of taking this one, but if, if your kids are struggling, and I'm a mom, and my kids are older, we have wonderful therapy in Delaware County. We have tons of counselors who accept all different types of insurance. Our county will help fund for drug and alcohol treatment. They'll cover co-pays. Um, we've also used Act 53 if the student is not interested in getting into treatment. That can be a helpful aid for parents. Um, we have wonderful ways, and I think that's a way to follow up. Because if your child is struggling, that's a red flag. That means they need some additional help. Does anybody else want to say anything? Uh, one last thing. I feel like mental health is a big thing going on now. And parents should talk to their kids, ask them if they're dealing with anything. But if it stays like that, it's a one-way track. I think it should go both ways. Kids should also try to be encouraged to ask their parents what they're going on. Because the parents are also dealing with work. They could be dealing with money issues or seeing their kids grow up. And it's just hard for them to see, like, let's say, they want to remember their kid as like a two-year-old child. But you look at them now and they're 17 and going to be ready to graduate from high school. It can be tough on a parent. So I think kids should take the step to make sure that their parents are also mentally okay and just be there for them as much as the parent is for the kid. Thank you everybody so much.